Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen. Amen. Namaste. for affirmation, announcements by the speaker. Honorable members, I have received communication from Mr. Dinesh Rambali, MP, member for Shugonas West, who has requested leave of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the member seeks is granted. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers. The Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honour to lay the Freedom of Information Exemption and Amendment Order 2023. The Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honour to lay paper number two, the delegation report of the 14th gathering of the PAL Americas Parliamentary Network for Gender Equality and the 19th Pal Americas Plenary Assembly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Leader of the House. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lead the following papers. Three, the ministerial response of the Ministry of Health to the third report of the Joint Select Committee on Human Rights equality and diversity on an inquiry into the discrimination faced by persons with mental health illness and the ability to access quality mental health care. Four, the ministerial response of the Ministry of Education to the ninth report of the Public Account Committee on the examination of the administration of the CAPE scholarship program as reported on in the special audit report within the report of the Auditor General on the public accounts of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year 2019. Five, the ministerial response of the Ministry of Finance to the sixth report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the internal controls expenditure and the accessibility and availability of diagnostic imaging services at public health institutions with specific reference to the Tobago Regional Health Authority. Thank you. Reports from committees. The member for Tunapuna. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the following report. The fourth report of the Joint Select Committee on Social Services and Public Administration on an inquiry into the mental health and psychosocial services available to the population during the COVID-19 pandemic, with a specific focus on measures to curb substance abuse and suicide. Third session, 2022-2023, 12th Parliament. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Prime Minister's questions. Honorable members, I'm advised that, as provided for in Standing Order 126, there is agreement between the sides that Prime Minister's questions will be taken at the next sitting of the House. I'm also advised that this means that there will be two Prime Minister questions day in the month of February. Agent questions. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Based on the um, statement that you have just made. Just, just for clarity, it will be two sets of questions on, on that set there at the next round of Prime Minister's question. 
I am quite confused by the question asked. In accordance with the standing orders, there's a set time. For pro there's a set day, there's a set time. My recollection is that 30 minutes are allowed. I'm also advised that this means that there will be two Prime Minister's questions days in the month of February. So I think that's clear. So you will have 60 minutes in one day, if that's what I'm being asked. Okay? There'll be two days. Great. Great? Perfect. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, um, Madam Speaker. As there are no urgent questions, there are four questions for oral answer. We'll be answering all four, and there are no uh, questions, no answers for written questions. Member for Coover North. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On behalf of the members, let's get with it. Can we kindly observe the standing orders with respect to members not speaking and also shouting across the floor? Member for Digo Martin Northeast, I do recognize that you are not participating in the process. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. On behalf of the member for Kuva North, question number 69 to the Minister of Planning and Development. Minister of Planning and Development. Thank you very much. Uh, in response to the question in the light of severe flooding and complaints, of unregulated and irregular building practices being a major contributor to riverine flooding. Will the minister state the measures undertaken to monitor and regulate building practices, especially those in close proximity to major water courses? The Ministry of Planning and Development through the Town and Country Planning Division, alongside the municipalities and other agencies of government, endeavors to ensure that relevant matters pertaining to unauthorized development are brought to the attention of the agencies holding the authority in law to intervene and take appropriate action. Specifically, the TCPD has undertaken the following measures to regulate and monitor building practices in an effort to minimize flooding within communities in collaboration with other regulatory and advisory agencies. These measures include one, constant review and updating land use policies, site development standards, and spatial planning guidelines. These once approved are published on the website of the TCPD and are made available to members of the public. They provide guidelines, guidelines to applicants and prospective developers who are then able to propose development that are approvable, undertaking responsibly, responsibly and sustainably and consistent with land use planning policy and relevant site development standards. The guidelines also designate and protect areas which are unsuitable for development and susceptible to natural disasters such as flooding. Two, the TCPD is currently preparing specific guidelines related to the undertaking of development in flood-prone areas and on hillsides, and the provision of advice regarding adaptation and mitigation measures related to the impacts of climate change. To this end, the TCPD has been incorporating requirements outlined in the Trinidad and Tobago Bureau of Standards Guide to design and construction of small buildings. Where development is proposed near to major water courses, the advice of the drainage division of the Ministry of Works and Transport is sought to determine appropriate building line setbacks, distance from the respective rivers, and measures for minimizing or preventing uh, flooding. Four, further to the TCPD, collaborates with other relevant agencies and organizations in the development approval process. These include the Drainage Division of the Ministry of Works and Transport, the EMA, the IMA, WASA, ODPM, and the University of the West Indies. 
The online development application process, known as Develop TT, was introduced into ALIA to provide a secure and transparent mechanism whereby all agencies involved in the construction permitting process can communicate and coordinate activities as it would relate to any individual application for planning permission. Five, applications that have been approved by the TCPD are forwarded to the re relevant municipal corporations for its processing. These developments cannot be implemented without the prior approval of the municipal corporation. To ensure the corporations are also aware of proposed developments that have been refused planning permission by the TCPD, these refusals are also forwarded to the relevant corporations. Six and last, enforcement against unauthorized development. If development occurs without the benefit of planning approvals, or in contradiction to a planning approval, the minister is empowered to undertake enforcement action to control the development of land and has been doing so through the issuance of enforcement notices. The issuance of enforcement notices premised on relevant research site visits and parameters based on Tongue and Country Planning Act, that is chapter 3501, is ongoing and it's a daily operation. All matters for which enforcement notices are issued and for which there have been non-compliance to the steps required to be taken as outlined in the notice are dealt with at the respective magistrate's court within the area which the subject site is located. Thank you. Member for Faisabad. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 81 to the Minister of Public Utilities. Minister of Public Utilities. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission has advised that with respect to the concerns of residents about the location of the power transmission towers in the vicinity of Superior Old Road and Akbar Trace, along the tower line route on which the Commission is installing a second 220 kilovolt double circuit electrical transmission line Meetings were held with the residents in Faisabad on June the 17th, 2022, July the 6th, 2022, and July 20th, 2022. Arising out of these meetings, Madam Speaker, the Commission reviewed the engineering designs and made adjustments to the approved tower line route where feasible that would minimize the impact on existing structures and residents. The Commission has advised further that it would be difficult to make any further changes since that would seriously and adversely affect the efficiency of the, the installation. Madam Speaker, it is important to further emphasize that the proposed route and design obtained previous approvals from the Environmental Management Authority and the Town and Country Planning Division and that continuous changes to the design can violate the terms and the conditions of those approvals. Member for Faisabad. Thank you, Minister, for that clarification. Can, Minister, can you indicate whether the issue of compensation for the lands acquired will fall under the remit of TNTEC? Member, I'm, I'm not going to allow that as a supplemental question based on the question asked and the answer. The answer. Member for Faisabad. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 82 to the Minister of Works and Transport. Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there, there exists a landslip located at the 24.6 km mark of the SS Erin Road in the vicinity of Skinner Trees. This is a large, complex landslip that's ha that has affected approximately one hectare of land, which includes a section of the SS Erin Road under the purview of the Ministry of Works, one residential building, and has resulted in the closure of the Skinner Trace under the purview of the Siparia Regional Corporation. This landslip originated in Skinner Trace, and since it was not addressed in a timely manner by the Siparia Regional Corporation, during the recent extreme rain, rainy season, the landslip progressed and affected a section of the SS Erin Road. This landslip is, is deemed critical as it affects the SS Erin Road, which is the main access road to Palaseco, Erin, and environs. 
Preliminary investigation suggests that the failure is not slump movement of soil, which is, a tip, which is typical for landslides in the southern region, but rather a flow and movement of an entire soil mass from uphill to downhill. It is proposed to address the repairs of this critical landslip in two phases. Phase one, procurement of a design consultant to complete geotechnical investigation, analysis of data and designs. Phase two, procurement of a contract contractor for construction. It is estimated that designs will be completed and tenders invited by the end of April 2023 and a contractor mobilized on site by the first week of June 2023. During this time, the ministry will ensure that the road is passable and is maintained by our in-house team. Thank you. Member for Faisabad. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 82 to the Minister of Works and Transport. Minister of Works and Transport. 83. 83, right. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the section of the road referred to as the Mondesi Delay Road is approximately 2.44 kilometers long and connects Mondesi Road to Delay Settlement Road. In-house patching work utilizing base material and hot mixed asphalt was conducted during November, 22, November 2022. This will be supplemented in due course by contracted sectional road rehabilitation work in 2023. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Minister. Minister, in terms of due course, can you perhaps put a time frame on that? Minister of Works and Transport. Man, Madam Speaker, my information is that the, there is a contract about uh, to be tendered. There's a, uh, the tender documents are prepared um, and should be tendered out shortly once the tender process have been completed, uh, a contractor will mobilize to have sectional uh, repairs done on the roadway. I estimate that to be within the next uh, two months or so. Thank you. Request for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance, statements by ministers, personal explanations, introduction of bills, motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a minister public business, private members' business, motions. Member for Faisalat. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, wish to, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas it is the responsibility of the Ministry of Health to protect, promote, and improve the health status of citizens, and whereas there have been numerous complaints from citizens regarding drug shortages and long waiting times for healthcare services at public health institutions, and whereas the report of the committee appointed to investigate the factors contributing to clinical outcomes of COVID-19 patients in Trinidad and Tobago also highlighted the existence of multiple chronic non-communicable diseases in our population. And whereas the government's approach to healthcare has failed to adequately treat with these public health issues, be it resolved that this House take note of the failure of the government to deliver on its healthcare, its health sector mandate. I beg to move. Member, is it that you've finished no, everything that you intend to say? No, sorry, Madam Speaker, I withdraw that. Yeah. Second, second. Oh, second, dear. sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to raise the following motion, standing in my name on behalf of the opposition. Madam Speaker, it is a privilege to pilot a motion on such a critical sector as health on behalf of the opposition, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for the opportunity. It is a common saying that health is your wealth. On a national level, the health status of citizens directly impacts on their productivity 
and therefore on the country's economic output. Some would say that proper health care is a human right. Is health a, hu a fundamental human right? Well, let us examine what has been said about this, Madam Speaker. The WHO Constitution, 1946, envisages, and I quote, the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being, said some 70 years ago, Madam Speaker. In his 2017 Human Rights Day message, WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Gabriesas said, and I quote again, no one should get sick and die just because they are poor or cannot access the health services they need. So this is the status of health on the international front, Madam Speaker. He further went on to say, this is the Director General of the WHO, the central principle of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is to ensure that no one is left behind. And as I welcome you, Deputy Speaker. So in, indeed, we have heard a whole lot about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and of course, health is a big, a big factor uh, in, these, uh, in these goals. Indeed, as parliamentary representatives, we can all here in this house attest to the fact that requests for assistance for services in the public health sector rank very close behind requests for food and housing in our society and in our constituencies. So Madam Speaker, I am saying that it should be in the interest of every member of this house for a critique of the healthcare system to be conducted on behalf of the many citizens who complain on a daily basis in this country. And I will come back to some of these complaints in more detail, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because it would seem that those who are unhappy with the state of the health sector come from all sectors of the society, including patients, their relatives, healthcare workers, and even some of our leaders. Before I delve into the motion, I wish to say this to the minister responsible for health under this government, my colleague, the member for St. Joseph. The, the arguments I'm bringing here today to the attention of the government is on behalf of all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Today is not only about critically analyzing the performance of the health sector, and one must appreciate that a critical analysis is required before improvements can be made. So it is not only about the critical analysis under your stewardship, but also about proffering solutions, and this I intend to do, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I go along. So I invite you, my colleague, member for St. Joseph, to listen with an open mind to what the people have to say because I'm saying this on behalf of the people. My observations and suggestions are based not only on my own experience as a medical practitioner, approaching some 40 years, including 20 years in the public health sector, five years experience in the UK NHS, and also experience as a chairman. So I've been there as chairman of the SWRHA, sitting in the, you know, in the governance chair of the health sector. And in addition, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic would have revealed many shortcomings in our health sector, um, as stated by, in the findings of the committee that was appointed by the Honorable Prime Minister to investigate the factors contributing to clinical outcomes of COVID-19 patients in Trinidad and Tobago. This is, report is not the, the subject of this motion today, but um, it is just an observation from this report. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this motion is mainly about the fate of the regular healthcare system since this government took office in 2015, and especially in the face of repeated claims by the member for St. Joseph of a dual healthcare system, a so called parallel healthcare system, to handle COVID 19 since 2020. Whilst the country was indeed fortunate to have a parallel healthcare system to treat with COVID 19 patients, Built initially on the sound infrastructure left by the People's Partnership Government under Kamala Prasad Bisesa at the Kuva, Kora, and Augustus Long Hospitals. But the evidence strongly suggests, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the regular healthcare system suffered badly because staff and supplies were simply diverted to the parallel healthcare system, leaving patients and remaining staff to fend for themselves in an under resourced regular health, health system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have no problem with this. Any government is entitled in times of crisis to so appropriate and you know, 
um, move the resources around. The problem I have <clears throat> is that you don't fool the population into believing that the regular healthcare system was still functioning normally. And Madam Speaker, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have to ask, what has the government done to address the long waiting list that resulted for clinic appointments, diagnostic investigations, and surgeries as a result of this situation? So, Member for St. Joseph, whilst I know it is your duty to defend your tenure over the past seven years, it would be nice for you to do so in a circumspect and empathetic manner, and I say this with the greatest of respect, with a view to taking on board some of the healthy suggestions and solutions that will emanate not only from this side of the House, but from other stakeholders whom I have consulted and who have contributed um, and sent suggestions in preparation for this motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, at some point in our lives, almost every one of us here, our family and our friends, will require healthcare services. And I just want to share an experience um, with the national population and particularly for the benefit of those in charge of healthcare resources and administration. And I recall one morning before a board meeting as chairman of Southwest, I took fellow board directors and senior administrative staff onto the balcony of the old boardroom, looked across to the hospital, and I said, you are doing this for you, and meaning that whatever we do as um, lawmakers, as administrators, um, as those in charge of governance, we are doing for us, each one of us, in the sense that we may all benefit, and it is therefore in our interest, everyone's interest, to ensure that the public healthcare system functions in a manner that provides timely and efficient service and represents value for money. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, quite sadly, what we are seeing and, having been, and, and have been seeing for the past seven years is a massive shortcoming on the part of the Ministry of Health in this regard or perhaps I should say an utter disregard on its part in fulfilling its stated vision. Indeed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the first recital of this motion uh, comes directly from the Ministry of Health's website to protect, promote, and improve the health status of citizens. Mr. Deputy Speaker, over $48 billion of taxpayers' money has been allocated to the Ministry of Health over the past seven years under this government. Of this sum, over 28 billion would have, be, would have gone to the regional health authorities. Yet, we hear daily cries from citizens of the poor treatment being meted out to them in public health institutions. Sometimes no treatment at all, and in a few instances, even the wrong treatment. Many in this country will say that the Ministry of Health is failing in its stated vision to protect, promote, or improve the health status of citizens. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I look at the second recital of this motion, um, the, complaint, the numerous complaints from citizens regarding drug shortages and long waiting times for healthcare services at public health institutions. And I just want to use a few examples, reported examples, to illustrate and to support um, the, the second recital in this motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So let's, let's, let's look at this one. Boy 13 gets surgery intended for someone else. And each of these, each of these reports from the newspaper, Mr. Deputy Speaker, has a lesson, has a lesson for what happens in the health sector. And hopefully, by sharing this information, we can all learn from this, especially those who are charged with looking after the healthcare services and looking after those who access healthcare services. So this is a situation here, it tells the trauma, and I, I, the article um, is reported in The Guardian, January 28, 2022, to quote, reported by Nikita Braxton Benjamin. And it tells the trauma of a young boy and his mother that had to go through because of a mistake made at the San Fernando General Hospital, when in fact, and just to summarize, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when in fact, um, the child would have gone for an operation on one eye with a squint and was inadvertently operated on um, on the, the good eye, the other eye. Very, very sad, very unfortunate, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Something that should happen to no one. Um, I'm not saying that as a medical professional myself, and there are errors that occur in health systems, but I'm saying that the RHAs, it, it reflects on the regional health authorities and um, in terms of the checks and balances in the RHA 
regarding surgical safety protocols. And indeed, there are surgical safety protocols in place, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the question is, why are these not being or weren't adhered to in this particular situation? So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when things like this happen, of course, um, it makes the public fearful of returning to public health institutions and undermines public confidence, confidence in the public health system. Another example, and I'm just using a few of these examples, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to make the point, reported on the Guardian newspaper of Wednesday, 16 February 2022, 20, 20, and it tells of an elderly man spending 72 hours waiting to be treated. Um, According to one relative, when the elderly man arrived at the San Fernando General Hospital's Accident and Emergency Department in late January, they told him that they are not going to do any form of treatment unless he's tested. The problem, though, is that the test could not be conducted at San Fernando. It had to be sent to Mount Hope. And the, the bottom line of this one is that the conclusion of the relative was that the patient was not given any meals, no medications, not given any form of attention as a patient, so technically, the patient was sitting on the pavement of the hospital. Again, speaks to customer service within the public health institutions. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, another report in the Newsday of Friday, 22nd January, um, speaks of a family's another traumatic experience, and this one related to the fact that um, a very ill patient had to wait some two hours for an ambulance, and again, um, it is a timely opportunity for us to review the ambulance service and the service we provide in terms of accessing and uh, getting patients to healthcare facilities in such a small country as always, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when citizens, you know, encounter these sort of delays and and poor service, you know, they ask questions such as, has our healthcare system collapsed? And this is, this is someone asking this question being reported in the media. Um, this one, and I will probably just use this as the last example from the newspaper here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but this one is important because it illustrates, again, when, when patients try to access health facilities, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, as a practitioner who worked in the public health service, I am very much aware that the quality of medical care in our public health institutions delivered by nurses and doctors is quite good. And, you know, it's, it's world-class standard. But what the issues that surround this seem to be is the access to care. And this is a great example. This is, uh, and I, I quote here again, this is January 16, 2021, and this is... Um, a wife speaking about her husband. She took her husband to the Arima General Hospital after he suddenly fell ill, I'm quoting here now, only to have hospital staff scold her on her parking instead of attending to her husband who was having a heart attack. You know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in this day and age, you, you know you would wonder, I mean, a, sick, a relative is bringing a sick one into a hospital. The last thing you want to scold them about is where they park, when in truth and in fact you should be dealing with the issue. But she followed and complied with the instructions. And Minister, I want to draw your attention to the fact that, you know, the security of the public health institutions are really a first customer service representatives. They are the ones that the public comes into contact um, first with. And sometimes that encounter can make a difference between life and death. In our time in government, under the uh, People's Partnership Government and the Honorable Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bissessa at that time, you know, we had taken steps to ensure that even those especially contracted security under, underwent and had proper training. And I'm hoping that, you know, this kind of, um, th this will, you know, is, being, is taking place, you know, or will not happen again. So the, the patient, the, unfortunately, the, the husband died, but her grouse was that you know, she felt in her own heart that not everything possible, everything um, that could have been done was done. Um, and in fact, um, I'm quoting here, she said that the insensitivity of the staff made the loss of her husband of 26 years that much harder to bear. She sent out an appeal, and I'm quoting, to Health Minister Terence D. Alsing to ensure that medical staff is properly trained 
and the proper life-saving equipment is installed at hospitals. So I'm just quoting this patient's pronouncements to the media here, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So again, I'm calling, and we have to look at the customer service that is provided in the hospitals. Now, that is customer service. What are the other aspects of the healthcare um, system that you know, is being complained about? Another aspect of it has to do with infrastructure. And if we look at the Daily Express of Thursday, 24 June 2021, where the staff at the Point Fortin Extended Care Center have complained about a leaking roof and rat infestation. This is a center which houses psychiatric patients and the socially displaced. As chairman of the Southwest, I had visited this, this particular center. Um, and they complained about rats and snakes and so on. And of course, this is demoralizing for the staff. And I just want to say um, that these are issues that need to be, need to be looked at. And again, I, may, I will come a little bit to the governance and the RHAs, Minister. And, and you know, you have, to, you have to ensure that there's proper governance and accountability um, within those who govern the RHA. Um, has, has your chairman, have your, have your chairman gone to every single facility? Have they visited personally um, these facilities to see firsthand, chairman and the CEO, what is going on? That is something that should be um, you know, happen on a regular basis. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to suggest to my friend, the member for Point 14, that he invite the chairman and the CEO of the SWRHE under which this facility falls to join him in a visit to that Point 14 extended care center to see firsthand the problems there and to fix it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the litany of woes and complaints against the health sector goes on and on. Um, I will limit my remarks in terms of the complaints. There have been several complaints. Um, the RHAs are mandated by way of public board meetings to account to the public. And this is a, a newspaper report from the last public board meeting. And again, we have to be honest with ourselves in the health sector. And this is a comment here from a former medical director, Dr. Anand Chattagoon, and the Minister of Health, the Minister of Health would have been well advised, Minister, to have kept, to have kept Dr. Chattagun on as your medical director, because he would have solved many of your problems, Minister. But I leave that, I leave that there. And your colleague, <laughs> your colleague, the member for San Fernando West, um, Minister, is aware that Dr. Anand Chattagun does not belong to the United National Congress yet under the visionary leadership of Kamala Prasad Bisesa. She chose to appoint the best person for the job and I see my friend from San Fernando West is smiling and he knows that that is true. And he does not, he does not hold a UNC party card. I will, not, I will not comment further, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I will leave that there for the time being. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as you can see, there are many, many issues that I've referred to, the long waiting times for clinic appointments, the long waiting times for surgeries, the lack of medicines and other basic supplies. Um, so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, moving on to the third recital of this motion, which speaks to the, the existence of multiple chronic non-communicable diseases in our population, as was highlighted, in fact, it was termed the NCD debt burden um, in the Simongal report. I just want to indicate at this point, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the whole issue of the chronic non-communicable diseases will be addressed um, by my colleague, the Member of Parliament for Komuto Manzalina, himself an experienced general practitioner and primary care physician, Dr. MP Dr. Rai Ragbir, when he makes his contribution, and other colleagues who will deal with other issues regarding to the overall health and well-being um, of our citizens. So that brings me to the uh, fourth recital in this motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I just want to read it again. And whereas the government's approach, and I emphasize approach, because this is broad, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and whereas the government's approach to healthcare has, been, has failed to adequately and effectively treat with these public health issues. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, what has been the Ministry of Health and the government's overall approach to healthcare in Trinidad and Tobago? 
And if you will permit me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to examine this government's approach to the health sector um, since they came into office in 2015, and just by way of comparison, to look at what the People's Partnership government did during the time 2010 to 2015 period, because I believe this is an important comparison and it can show what differences in philosophy um, and policy, you know, how that can benefit or not benefit citizens. So our approach in the People's Partnership government under then Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bisesa, the PPG government, was similarly a P, what I call the PPG model of healthcare, Mr. Deputy Speaker. What do I mean? The PPG model of healthcare, the P stands for people. We're always people-centered. We recognize people as an important human resource and looked after them, doctors and nurses and all healthcare workers, special way. The second P in the PPG stands for plant, the infrastructure. And I'll come to the track record of infrastructure in the health sector in a moment, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And of course, the G in the PPG as the basis of the health sector improvements regards governance, and this speaks to process, oversight, and accountability. So, people, how did we treat people? I give examples here, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Under the PPG government, under the partnership, every effort was made to keep young doctors meaningfully employed. In 2015-2016, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a situation arose in this country for the very first time where hundreds of young doctors who had graduated completed their internships and were unable, unable to be offered jobs in the public health sector. And this is in a situation where there was a shortage of doctors um, and complaints about poor service in the hospitals. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to make the point that we cannot, as a nation, invest millions of taxpayers' dollars in training young doctors and then failing to employ them, especially when the health sector is facing so many problems. I believe that an urgent conversation needs to be had between the Ministry of Health and the Faculty of Medical Sciences, UWI, regarding the intake of medical students and regarding the synchronizing of intake with employment and whilst one does not want to limit um, intake based on the wishes and the qualification and intentions of young doctors, um, who want, of young persons who want to study medicine, it's important that we have to find a place for them, if not within Trinidad and Tobago, perhaps within the, Car the CARICOM region regarding further um, regional opportunities. And this is a discussion that needs to be had. In fact, um, in Cuba, and it is, uh, the system there is that the, um, the Faculty of Medicine comes under the Ministry of Health. It's, it's a good health system where there's synchrony between the number of medical students and the requirements, um, the, the, the need for doctors. So that, has been, that was our approach to, to, to employ them, make sure they were employed. In contrast, the current government's approach is to leave doctors unemployed to give them short-term contracts, which affects their, long, their training, ability to specialize, and so on. Um, and in fact, the worst we saw was where a team of experienced doctors was moved from the Coover Hospital at the peak of the COVID-19, something that may have very well affected the outcomes of patients. But I'll leave that there, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Our, our um, plan was to support nurses and nurses training. We had the Eldorado Nursing School uh, we created a category of staff called the Enrolled Nursing Assistants to assist um, the nurses, qualified nurses in the hospitals. And of course, we brought legislation in 2014 by way of the Nurses and Midwives Act to create the Advanced Nurse Practitioner and Nurse Intern. So we supported nurses. We understood the importance of nurses. We, we understood that they form a very important part of the healthcare sector. Um, this government, you know, they have allowed the nurses to fly the coop. You know, the they, they nurses have been treated badly. There have been situations where they're not encouraged to stay. And again, we saw situations where they were overworked and underpaid and stressed and so on. And that became very apparent during the COVID-19 crisis. Our approach would have been to make healthcare more accessible at health centers with extended hours. And again, this was important. It was part of our strategy to ensure that we strengthen primary healthcare, that we ensure that those who are working could go to a health center after 4 p.m. and get their blood pressure checked, get their numbers checked, 
They could do that on a Saturday morning and in some places on a Sunday morning without having to lose time from work. That was a very visionary um, initiative under the, our government. We also employed customer service representatives in the accident and emergency um, departments, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, their approach has been um, to discontinue the extended hours. What about the issue with plant and infrastructure? Well, of course, the PPG completed the Scarborough Hospital in 2011, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But unfortunately, the, the cardiac cat lab, which was in that hospital, has been abandoned since 2016. And my colleague, the member for Tobago East, is in the house. And remember, I, I urge you to look into that situation. That is something that can benefit both the residents and the many tourists who come to Tobago. It's an important initiative, and you should perhaps look into that. We opened the San Fernando Teaching Hospital in 2014. That was our approach. Mr. Deputy Speaker, because in, in 2010, when then Prime Minister, Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bissessa came into, into office, there was a situation at the San Fernando Hospital with regards to a shortage of beds. And her vision allowed the, um, the then incomplete office building on Chancery Lane to be converted into the San Fernando Teaching Hospital, thereby adding an additional, some additional 214 beds to the um, old teaching hospital. What has been their approach, Mr. Deputy Speaker? And this is something that is painful, painful to me because there are two floors in that teaching hospital, Mr. Deputy Speaker, which were designed specifically for training of doctors and teaching, right? And two of those floors were, have now been occupied or since been occupied by a human resource department. So a clinical space the then board, with or without the permission of the minister, I'm not sure, chose to move their human resource department into a purpose-built space, and therefore that has been the approach, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So I'll leave that, I'll leave that and I'll move on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we created a dedicated cardiac ward at the San Fernando Hospital in 2011 in anticipation of a cardiac catheterization lab to be built at the San Fernando Hospital. I'll come back and speak about that in a moment. We opened a new eye theater, um, but now we see that there's a long waiting list for cataracts. We provided the equipment for what is called VR surgery. It stands for vitreo retinal surgery. It is, it is sight-saving surgery, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and especially with our high numbers of diabetics. If that surgery is not provided, then um, persons can lose their sights. What is the current situation? Current situation for VR surgery is that the only place it's been offered in is in Tobago. Nothing is wrong with that, but it means that patients have to travel. It means that there's a long uh, waiting, um, and therefore that is um, something that, that needs to be looked at. So before I leave the San Fernando Hospital, General Hospital, let me just come back to the, the cardiac catheterization lab, and I speak of this in the context of the high number of heart disease and cardiac cases, and we saw that patients with COVID-19 died because of comorbidities, cardiac disease being one of the main, and we do have that burden, and my colleague will speak about it. But I just want to point out that under the partnership, a space was identified in 2013, 2014. A user brief was designed, and tenders were sent out to build that cat lab. When the government changed in 2015, you know, they thought that they had to change the user brief and they had to retender and so on. That's, that's fine, if that's the approach, that's fine. But how can you explain, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that seven years later, we are nowhere closer to having the cat lab. The minister has made many pronouncements in this house. And again, I would want to ask him you know, on behalf of the population, that when he speaks, that he will give the assurance that this lab will be completed at the San Fernando Hospital in this financial year. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, of course, I'm speaking about plant and infrastructure. Our response, our initiative was to build the Coover Children's Hospital in 2015. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, what was their response? Their response was to close it down, to change the name of the hospital and left it, left it closed for five years until 2020, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
until COVID came and they were forced to open the hospital. You know what is, you know, if, if this were not serious, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it would be funny because for so many years it was touted as a construction site. And then within a matter of two weeks, within a matter of two weeks, it was able to be opened for the benefit of patients. But I'll leave that there, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Several other infrastructural developments we would have made um, in anticipation, you know, of um, things that may come. We renovated the Augustus Long Hospital and the modern operating theater did serve as a nice unit during COVID. Um, but of course, their response um, would have been to shut it down with the closure of Petrotrin, and that has caused thousands, suffering to thousands of former employees and retirees. I will leave that for one of my colleagues to deal with. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, of course, we turned the suds for the Arima and Point Fourteen hospitals. Um, they built it eventually, it took five years to build. Um, again, fiddling with the specs and claiming that they save money. And this is a boast by this government of saving money by you know, re redoing specs and so on. But the point I want to make here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that you know, what about the loss of health benefit for the residents of those communities in Arima and Point Fourteen? during the five years, so you're saving money, fine. But in the interim, I'm making the point that when you're taking so long and you're claiming to save money, you were increasing the disease debt burden on the public purse in the meantime. In other words, patients who were not able to access these facilities would have gotten sick and there would have been a, a greater cost to the public purse in the, in, the, in the end. So really and truly, we have to look in terms of doing what is called a cost-benefit analysis, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, so these hospitals are finally open, but still short of full staffing, and I trust that the minister is taking all steps to fully staff these hospitals, especially with the fact that you have a number of unemployed doctors and nurses um, out there. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask you how long I have again? Uh, you, you have approximately 10 minutes, honorable member. Um, so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, in terms of process, we spoke about people, we spoke about plan, talk about the process. Uh, we created the External Patient Program, a very innovative initiative, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This was created in recognition of the limited capacity to meet with demand for investigations and treatment. Um, what is the status of that program? I know it's still in existence, but we, I've had numerous complaints from constituents and others regarding difficulty in accessing this program. Um, I don't know whether it is because of governance issues in the program or whether it is because of the funding issues. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I just want to move on quickly to renal dialysis, and I use this example, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in terms of the government's um, approach to renal dialysis. And if you will permit me to read from the budget statement of 2022, not the budget statement of 2023, and this is the statement presented by the Honorable Member for the Martin Northeast in his budget presentation. And this is what is promised here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in that budget statement. A National Center for the Treatment and Management of Renal Disease at the Coover um, Hospital was promised in the budget of 2022. Do you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that when the budget of 2023 was read, and I paid particular attention because I was interested, the treatment of renal disease in this country is very important. We have a lot of kidney patients, a lot of patients suffering renal failure. But you know, lo and behold, when the budget statement of 2023 was read, not a single word, not a mention either in the budget statement of this promise, was this pie in the sky? and not, not a statement by the Minister of Health about this facility. So I ask today on behalf of the population, what has become of this promise? Is this really going to be built? Or was it just another empty promise by this PNM government? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I just want to move on quickly um, with regards to um, process and, and how we conducted business. And I just want to refer to what I would call three quality of care reviews. Quality of care reviews, every government comes in, they will do a review of different aspects of, this, of the health sector. In 2011, uh, 2013, uh, the partnership government under the 
direction of the then Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bisesa, um, got the maternity services review report, which um, we started the implementation, we came out of office in 2015, we, we couldn't complete everything, of course. There was no politics involved in this, we were just there to, we had a committee which was across the board. I've mentioned the membership of this committee already in this house, the document is there for public perusal. Um, so, implementation was started. The minister, of course, will come and mention that the things that were achieved under his watch, but based on this platform, we have no problem with that. It has benefited the citizens of this country, it has benefited pregnant women, mothers, and we are happy. We are happy to have provided the platform for this government to build. We provided other platforms, of course, which they refused to run on, but that's another story, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So they quietly run with this on this track. Um, so in 2016, of course, the PNM government came into office, commissioned the Welch Report, but they decided to play politics with it. And that has been politics every time it's asked. You, um, you are told that it was being brought to a joint select committee and it could not be implemented um, because we refused to sit on the joint select committee. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to clear the on that today because the point about it is that that report did not require the expertise, time, or the expense of a joint select committee. It contained recommendations that could have easily been implemented. Um, and I believe the ministry and the minister has now started to do that quietly. But where, is, where, are they, where, where, where have they reached with regards to the, the implementation? And the, the, the fact of the matter is the implementation has been very slow. And this report was examined by the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee in this very house. Uh, and a report was sent to the ministry. And the findings were that the implementation rate of the recommendations was low. And again, there were hindrances such as the financial constraints, human resource management, time lag in approval and implementation for the design and approval of projects and work activities, bottlenecks of the procurement process for goods and services, and so on. And in fact, that PEAC report provided some very good recommendations to the Ministry of Health with regards to looking at these weaknesses. So what has been re the response of the Ministry, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Mr. Deputy Speaker, these reports from the PEAC look at current expenditure and look at the administration and so on of services. And the response is supposed to be brought back to the parliament from the ministry within about 60 days. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it has been over one year and I checked with the parliament as recently as yesterday and a response is yet forthcoming from the Ministry of Health on this particular report, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And one wonders, one wonders, you know, how it is um, that it can be taken so long for the Ministry of Health to respond to a parliamentary committee, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I close, I, I just want to reiterate, um, I, I, want to, I, I just want to quote from an Express newspaper article dated January 15, 2023, and reporting the following with, res, with reference to the state of the health sector. If ever visionary leadership is needed in the medical fraternity, it is now. Even before COVID-19 read its ugly head, Trinidad and Tobago face considerable challenges in and its health apparatus. Lengthy wait times in hospitals, unreasonable delays in receiving critical diagnoses, results and reports on confusing and unnecessarily complex administrative processes among the many issues experienced by patients at our institutions. I will leave it there, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I do not want to run foul of the standing orders of this Honorable House, but those are, are words that were spoken by a very high official in this country. And as I conclude, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to say that I will conclude my contribution on this private motion in the very spirit in which I started. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I believe that the evidence presented here this afternoon clearly supports the resolution of this motion, which is calling upon the House to take note of the failure of the government to deliver on its health sector mandate. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I indicated in piloting this motion, it is in the interest of all of us in this house to ensure that the country has the best healthcare system possible with the resources expended. Our interest on this side has and will always be to continue 
to look after the welfare of each citizen of our beloved nation, whether it is to protect them from crime, from economic hardship, or to ensure proper health care for them. The Honorable Member for St. Joseph knows that he can still call on myself and my colleague, the Member for Komoto Manzalina, to discuss medical issues of national importance and that we will speak in these circumstances wearing only our medical hats. It is in this spirit that the leader of the opposition, the member for Siparia, met with the Honorable Prime Minister in 2020 during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic to offer our suggestions on this side. It was in this spirit that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition made efforts in early 2021 to get COVID-19 vaccines for our citizens. And it was in this spirit that the Honorable Leader of the Opposition, in a budget contribution on 30th September 2022, gave commitments to this House and to the country for the improvement of the health sector, which I wish to repeat and endorse here today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I close. And these were stated in the budget, and I repeat, for the benefit of the population, uh, the, the initiatives that we will keep when we get back into government at the next opportunity. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, these are the words of the opposition leader in the budget presentation. We will immediately make the necessary legislative changes to the Children's Life Fund. We will, we will implement a patient child. Uh, Honorable Member, just for the record, you have two more minutes. We will implement a patient charter with waiting times, guidelines, and timely care guarantees to address some of these issues I spoke about. We will re-implement the extended hours at the health centers. We will implement a way to do non-urgent surgeries on a weekend to deal with the backlogs. We will explore the potential capacity of other sectors to complement these initiatives. We will re-implement the health, the health card to monitor dispensing of medication and detection of abuse. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we will introduce a mobile diagnostic unit with MRI, CT to ease the backlog and improve accessibility for non-Asian cases. These are just some of our plans as we prepare to take back the seat of government, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And with those few words, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank you. Um, member, and you? I beg to move. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I uh, the motion and I reserve my right to speak. <clears throat> Honorable members, the motion being seconded, I shall now propose the question for debate. Be it resolved that this House take note of the failure of the government to deliver on its health care sector mandate. I now recognize the member for St. Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I start off by saying that this motion is devoid of any substance, and I will explain why. On Wednesday, 31st May 2017, this is just about less than a year and a half after we attained government. On that date, the Welsh report, as inaugurated by the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, was laid in this parliament. And we asked the member for Separia to go to a joint select committee to examine these matters and all other matters pertaining to healthcare. Do you know what the response of Separia was? No. This is the Hansard of Wednesday, 31st May 2017 establish a joint select committee that will look at the two reports that have been presented. Objective, to allow the people's representatives, that includes Faisabad, that includes Komoto, that includes Karani East, to go through a detailed analysis of the report to come back to Parliament and give their findings. For transparency, for transparency, and I quote, and also for all members in this House to be given the opportunity to examine the report in depth. The best mechanism for doing this, we feel on this side, is through the mechanism of a joint select committee. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I put it to this country that history will not absolve Separia for refusing to go to a joint select committee. History will not absolve her because it is not their intention to solve problems, 
because they put party before country. This was an opportune time to put country before party, but not Separia. And history will have the last say on the member for Separia. What is the purpose of a Joint Select Committee? The Joint Select Committees have wide powers. Not only, as the member said, because he knew I was going to come with this. Not only are you considering the wealth report, but you have wide powers to fully consider their mandates and facilitate an actor interaction between members of parliament and the government officials, and listen to this, interested parties. You could have called anyone you wanted to call, legal and other professional associations, and the general public in deliberations. That is what you could have done but you refuse to do it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is an absolute tragedy when errors happen in any health sector as they do around the world. But how we treat with those errors in a political environment is despicable. The member brought up the issue of the eye surgery, an absolute tragedy, we agree. But did we on this side seek to make political hay out of the accident on baby cottle? Do you remember that? Under Fouad, Fouad Khan, did we blame the UNC when that baby's head was sliced open? We did not. But that is what you do, party before country. Did we come and excoriate you about the Crystal Ramsimir affair? We did not. That happened under Fuad Khan. But the member for Faisabad and all of them don't know how to deal with these tragedies when they occur. They seek to make political hay out of it. These are traumatic experiences, but let's deal with it in the proper way. The member spoke about vermin in the extended care center in point 14. What he did not see was that this center was refurbished in 2021 and fixed. He did not say that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, my friend spoke about, and you see he opened the door, so I am entering the door that my colleague has opened. He spoke about he was in the governance chair at Southwest RHE. Well, let me tell you about that governance chair. One, when I came into office, the overcrowding at the San Fernando a and &E was phenomenal. People had to wait days in the a and &E. That has been stopped. This uninspired leader did that. Your words. The labor ward, and as an OBGYN, you did nothing to progress and advance maternity care. I did that. This one. Could the member tell me about the four million overpayment of staff under your finance department when you were chairman of Southwest RHA. That is governance issues, four million overpayment, which we are still trying to recover. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise on standing order 48-6. The member is imputing improper motives and this is not a substantive okay, motion thanks. against the Thanks, member. Overruled. Thank you. Could the member, as he said, he was in the governance chair, tell us about the man he employed, a known embezzler, who was charged before the courts and hired as his director of policy, who put together a cut and paste strategic plan from another country, plagiarism. Could he tell us about the deporty pedophile he employed to work in Southwest RHA? And he wants to tell me about governance issues? Could he also well, explain Mr. why? Mr. Deputy Speaker, 48-6, the, the minister is imputing improper motives on the part of my colleague, the MP for Faisabad, and I ask that it immediately be retracted. OK. Honorable member, again, we need to be very careful in terms of the he or the person that we may be referring to, right? So again, I need to 
give you a little leeway, but please be careful when, when you're identifying. If you, can, if you cannot be too specific, I would prefer that we move on from, from those aspects because it's, it's he and him, that sort of thing. I leave those governance issues because the member knows it's the truth. The member spoke about... Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, again on 48.6, did the minister retract the accusations he made in relation to the conduct of my colleague, the MP for Faisabad? Right. Um, honorable members, okay, as the chair, right, we need to ascertain in terms of referral, honorable minister, I, I don't know if I need to see clarity as to who that he is or him is with regards to that the member for Kuva South is referring to. So, so if, if it is that it's clearly directed at the, a particular member here, I will probably ask you to retract it and move on. Sir, no that problem. No, 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 not no problem. I retract. Thank you. The member for Faisabad spoke about the economy and health that health is related to the economy. How could a health system that has collapsed, as you said, produce a life expectancy of 73.79 years in 2022, increased by 0.16% from 2021, even with COVID? Life expectancy, one of the greatest inputs into life expectancy are gender, genetics, hygiene, diet and nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, and access to health care. How could our life expectancy continue to go up? And then you spoke about GDP. It relates to the economy. Well, in relation to increasing life expectancy and the economy, the CSO just put out. Whereas it was predicted that real GDP will decline by 0.1%, it has actually increased by 1.6%. And real GDP has increased by 6.6% in second quarter 2022. And for the first half of 2022, it will be 4.1%. So let's link healthcare, access to healthcare, life expectancy, and the economy. That is why your argument holds absolutely no water on macroeconomic indicators. Mr. Deputy Speaker, he will go, uh, sorry, the member will pick articles from the newspaper, but you know what the member will not say? That in coming into office in 2015, I met a dengue situation in this country because public health is important. Where in 2014, because they put everything under the member for Separia, under the member of Separia, Suspected cases of dengue was 5,157. You know what it is today? 28. For the past five years, we have had no dengue-related deaths in Trinidad and Tobago. Who did that? Who did that? A green man from Mars or this inspired leader that you are quoting? Who did that? Under Separia. 5,157 suspected cases of dengue. 2015, 1,687. 2016, 1,522. Under my tenure, 2017, 644. 2018, 332. And today, double digits, with no deaths in the past five years. But my friend will not quote that. Will not quote that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to touch on some issues. I have a lot to say, but other speakers will come on to it. He has a particular partial for San Fernando General Hospital. As far as the UNC is concerned, the healthcare system is only San Fernando General Hospital. That is all they talk about, and Tobago. He will not tell you, sorry, the member will not tell you that in San Fernando Hospital, for the put, for July, December 2022, they performed 5,359 surgeries. Post-pandemic. So we are catching up with the backlog after pandemic. The member will not tell you there were 117 CVC line insertions. There were 634 obstetric cases, 792 ophthalmology cases, 
the member will not share that good news with the country because it's not convenient. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I now come to one of the most aggravating aspects of the COVID-19 response. And that has to do on the attacks on public servants in this country by the UNC under the leadership of Separia. Calling doctors and their performance of their duty state-sanctioned homicide, as per Tim Gopi Singh. Bad talking Roshan, Dr. Mariam Abdul Richards, and all others. And you know what is perplexing? I could understand that from the UNC, but not one professional organization stood up for their colleagues and said, that is not right. Not one. There was a failure of the professional class to tell Separia, you do not do things that way. And I urge the next speaker. 48.5, a member shall be referred to in this house by reference to her constituency or her official portfolio, not Separia. <laughs> oh, okay, member. Okay, thank, thank you, members. Again, member, right? Member but I said Separia. Separia. No, please. Right, that's the ensure called by the proper titles. The member of Parliament for Separia. But you would not condemn the words. That is the important thing. Not in nomenclature of the member. You will not condemn the instruction. And I urge. And I am looking forward to the next speaker, who is going to be my good colleague, MP for Kumoto Manzanilla. If he stays silent on this issue, history will not absolve him. If he does not get up and take an independent line and said that attack on public servants was wrong, history will not absolve him, because he is a member of that fraternity. I wait to see with bated breath if anyone has the guts to protect public health care workers in Trinidad and Tobago. Deputy Speaker, 48-1. The relevance, this is not the motion. Okay. Overrule. Proceed. Thank you. The member for Faisabad went on about the external re, um, patient program. You see, people who receive service don't write letters to the editor in any large numbers. Do you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the taxpayer spends $34 million a year to two private providers to radiate people at a cost of $57,000 per patient? We do that. And in the public sector, we're under Northwest RHA. Our LINAC, our government-owned LINAC, put down at a cost of $75 million has seen 1,057 patients in two and a half years. Ask RR from Chickland. They will never write a letter to a letter. Ask MS from Santa Flora. I can't call their names. I'll call their initials. GR from Separia. HN from Pinal. MA from San Grande. JS from Pitti Valley. And LE from Mova. But these individuals who receive all of this free under the EPP, don't write letters to the media. They receive the good service, and we are thankful. And they are thank thankful. I hear mumbling from the member of parliament for Separia. What about dialysis? The, men the member spoke about dialysis. Does the average dialysis patient and does the public know that it costs the taxpayers, it's not free, eh? it costs the taxpayers $136,000 a year to dialyze one patient? $136,800. And you know how many people we dialyze? 1,090. Isn't that, this, isn't that a health system that is delivering something? Ask XCM from Shogwanas, AR from Princess Town, RG from Arima, 
LR from Barakpo and MP from St. Anne's. But they will not complain. Right? It's a th I can't call it a thousand people. Ask the people, the 67 Mr. persons Mr. who received Angie. Would the minister give way? No. But why are you sharing? Ask the, si ask the 67 people. Member for Separia, member for Separia, we know clearly of the procedure. He did not give way. Please. Members. Hold on, hold on. Members, all members, please. Proceed. In medical circles, you use initials. Well known. When you're doing case studies, it is well known. Ask Faisabad. What about the 67 persons who receive angioplasty services at $62,000 a pop that cost this country $4.1 million? None of them will write a letter to the editor. The 141 people who receive cabbage services at $68,150.25 per pop at a total cost of 9.6 million people. The member spoke about virectomy. The 73 people just in the past few months at $30,000 a pop cost the country 2.1. That is what this government has done made these tens of millions of dollars available to patients. But the member of parliament for Faisabad will never, ever admit that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, our NCD program, you could see our life expectancy going up. What have we done? We have launched the TT Moves program the Hearts Program, the Gestational Diabetes Program, the Diabetic Wellness Centers are going to be rolled out, one in Princess Town, where's Princess Town? One in Diego Martin. Um, we already have one in, um, in Eric Williams and one in Sangri Grandi to tackle the issue of diabetic foot amputations and to make sure we don't amputate legs and toes unless we really have to. What about our physical equipment, our schools program? All of that was done under our NCD program. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is so much we could see. The member of parliament from Faisabad spoke about drug shortages. I promise this country, in the light of global supply chain challenges, we will try very hard not to have chronic that is, drug shortages over a long period of time. The member for Faisabad does not remember when he was CEO of Southwest, he could not supply chemotherapy for the taxi driver from Princess Town. There was a picture of them protesting outside South Southwest. You remember that? He would not talk about that newspaper article. So let me talk about drug shortages. Johnson & Johnson posts temporary Tylenol shortage amid heightened demand. These are global issues. Two. Omicron sparks paracetamol and ibuprofen shortage. This is an, in our first world country. I'm not going to call the country. But I'll just say this, this particular country was one that I was excoriated by, by Napa Rima when he got a free COVID home kit. I say, why we can't be like that country? You remember that? Yeah. Right, it's that country. And in that country, they are telling you not to come to hospital. In that country, you have to wait 20 hours for an ambulance now. And Naparima was brandishing this COVID kit and say, why we can't be like that? Well, let me tell you something. I don't want to be like that. Amen. I ain't calling the country name, brother. Amen. Right? Drug supply has been unable to cope with rocketing demand caused by coronavirus. The data suggests shortages of the painkillers have worsened considerably since Omicron sent cases rocketing. 
We are in a global supply chain issue. Another first world country, paracetamol, amoxicillin, pediatric drug shortages worry countries, professionals. I'm not going to call the name of the country, but even basic amoxil, you can't get in that first world country. But this is one. Pharmacy Magazine, 25th January 2022. Let the country know how hard we work to keep our supply chains open. A government issues shortage protocol for paracetamol suppositories. This is Panadol suppositories. And a government, in light of global shortages, has to issue protocols with how to deal with this. The health, the Department of Health and Social Care has issued a serious shortage protocol for paracetamol 120 and 240 milligram suppositories due to significant ongoing disruption to supplies. That is what we are faced with. CNN headline, empty pharmacy shelves shine light on vulnerabilities on country name, drug supplies. And the opposition always tells us why we can't be like these countries, these first world countries. Well, brother, I give thanks every single day for our free public healthcare system with the challenges that it has. And I say openly, we have challenges like every other healthcare system. But my God, we do a lot better than first world countries. In first world countries, if you don't have insurance, you will watch those buildings, you will watch those MRI machines, and you will have no access to it. You will watch those drugs, and you will have no access to it. Naparima is shouting out, not in that country. Well, you can't even get an ambulance to take it to the hospital in that country. If you want, you go there. You go there and call an ambulance. Member, please. Yes, sorry. Direct, direct to the chair, please. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if the member for Naparima wants to live in that country, let him go there and try and call an ambulance to take him to a hospital. One, there is none. And if you get one, it takes you 20 hours. And the emergency departments are either closed or overcrowded. But the member of uh, Naparima wants us to be like that. Well, not me. I will take what we have here with all its problems like every other healthcare problem. But let's fix it and the opportunity to have fixed it laid before you in 2017 when we said, let's go to a joint select committee. Let's call people. Let's call doctors. Let's call nurses. Let's call patients. Let's call the lawyers. Let's call everybody. But the member of parliament, the honorable Kamla Pasad Bisesa, SC MP, flatly refused because it was not in their interest to partner with the PNM to fix healthcare. So therefore, we will fix it on our own. Other members will speak about the advances we have made in other areas. Other members will speak about, and let me just add my one cent worth on this. There was a recent expose in the Sunshine newspaper. You know everything in that article was false? Every single point was false? And I know that the timing of that article and the timing of this motion is purely coincidental. It could not have been contrived. It could not have been planned. The motion was filed on Monday. The article came out on Tuesday, and it's totally, totally coincidental. Mr. Deputy Speaker, another article. State of emergency inside 
country name called First World Countries ER Crisis. So let me talk about our ER services in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Trinidad and Tobago, we use the Canadian CETAS system, CETAS Canadian Triage Acuity System. And let me say up front, a, an accident in emergency is not a first come, first serve system. It is not. It is a worst come, first serve system. Worst come, first serve. And the Canadian Triage Acuity System lays down some goals which you should try to achieve. So when patients present to your accident and emergencies, you have these guidelines and goals to achieve. We achieve them most of the time for the most severe and the most acute cases. That is, cases after triage are listed as one and two where if you don't treat those persons urgently within 15 minutes to 30 minutes, they will die. They will die. And that's what we do. And I want to hail and thank our emergency accident and emergency doctors, nurses, wards mates. You have approximately two minutes of your initial speaking time. You have an additional 15. Get to yes. Proceed. So what do we do? All countries that use the CETA system try to adhere to the times. So level one, and it's important for the public to know, what are level one cases? These are the most acute that need immediate action to prevent that person from dying on you. Some examples will be victims of gunshot wounds, major accidents, that is major trauma, major penetrating trauma to vital organs. You have a lot of blood loss. Now compare that to a mother waiting outside with a son who got a bee sting, who may have reached before the gunshot victim came in. Now as far as that mother is concerned, and we understand that, her son's bee sting is the most important thing to her. She was here before. The accident victim com comes in now. Under CETAS, we treat those first based on their acuity and those who need resuscitation almost immediately, otherwise they will die. And you are supposed to treat those within, within 15 minutes. We achieve these goals most of the time. For level two, these are emergencies that don't necessarily require immediate resuscitation. These are like strokes and evolution, your myocardial infarctions. They are critical, but you have more time than the gunshot victim who is losing blood. We try to see those within 15 to 60 minutes. Level three, and this is where we run into problems. And I will admit this. One of the critical areas we have to work in in our a and is communications. Because whilst we are treating patients to save lives, I don't think we always communicate with the waiting relatives, and they are anxious. I admit that. And it's something we are working on. And at North Central RHA and Southwest, we have ambassadors now to be that liaison. But I do admit, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we can do more communications. Level three under CETAS, things like appendicitis, upper and lower GI bleeds that require urgent investigation and to be warded to prevent them from transitioning to one and two. And this is where we get the most licks in the public health care system, four and five. Four and five, viral illnesses, sprains, minor BP elevations, back pains. These really should not come to an a and &E but many people rush to an a and &E. This could be managed by your GPs in their clinics and health centers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am so grateful for this opportunity to talk about the a and &E system. And I got this quote from the CETAS website today. Emergence, and this is their words, emergency patients are unique. 
not all patients are as well as they appear, and not all patients are as sick as they think. However, the person presenting to the a and &E, as far as they are concerned, they want immediate attention. But nowhere in the world do you do that. Because if you do that, you do not use your scarce resources wisely, and people will die. So you have to allocate scarce resources to your CTAS level one, that is, the gunshot victim, the major accident person who is suffering from trauma, who needs immediate resuscitation. And your strokes, your MIs, then your cases like appendicitis and so on. So I admit, and I say it, that we could improve on communications. Because what gives rise to anxiety is not that the patient isn't getting care. The patient is getting care, but the family members outside don't know that the patient is getting care. And I will rededicate myself to that. The a and &E system in a public, and you see, I, I draw the distinction between a public healthcare system and a private healthcare system. The a and &E in a public healthcare system has totally different dynamics that are private. You don't take accident victims and gunshot victims to a private hospital. You come to a public hospital. You don't take these severe trauma patients to a private hospital. So the a and &E system in a public hospital is only effective because of the CETAS triad system. But the individual, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is rightly only concerned about their own circumstance. We understand that. But our objective is to treat all based on acuity and urgency. But the most urgent and acute must and will always be treated first because they are at greatest risk of demising early. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how much more time do I have left? You finish just about 318? 3 3-1-8. So I have 10 minutes again. The member for Faisabad spoke about hospital construction plant. We built the Point Fortin Hospital, not you. We financed it. It wasn't financed by NGC as a member for Parliament for Separia claimed. It was built with loan financing. The Arima Hospital was not, as a member for Separia has claimed, built with NGC financing. It was built with loan financing by this government. The Coover Hospital never admitted one patient under the UNC. They opened it two weeks before an election. They never treated a single patient in Coover. Not one patient. We are building the Port of Spain General Central Block, 540 beds. That is a project which should have been built before Coover. If you were concerned about Trinidad and Tobago, because the member for pa Parliament for Separia, the Honorable Kamla Pasad Bisesa, had the report which said clearly that Central Block was a seismic risk. It was dereliction of duty in my opinion. And again, history will not absolve you from that omission. But you built Coover. It is this administration that is building the 540-bed, 13-story tower at Port of Spain. And let me speak directly again to Port of Spain General Hospital. That campus is under stress. Why? Because of ongoing construction in a live hospital setting and also the concurrent demolition of the old central block. I have met with staff members, I have met with union representatives to thank them for their patience, but they are under stress. But better days are ahead for you at that Port of Spain campus. When we open that new block, all of your issues would have been addressed. And I really thank the Chief of Staff, the Director of Health, the CEO, the GM of Nursing, 
and everybody at Port of Spain General Hospital for their absolute patience and dedication to duty. I absolutely thank them. Your days for that type of stress, we're going to have a few more months of it with a couple more months with the demolition. I was there up to last week. The demolition is going <coughs> a bit slowly because we are doing it for the first time in a live hospital setting. The weather last year, uh, the rains in September, October, November did not help. It did not help at all. It was heavy, heavy rains. So for a variety of reasons, the demolition activities have been slowed. Um, this week we had to suspend activities, but we are hoping to start back full. I spoke to the contractors up to yesterday, hopefully by next week, Tuesday. And we are working very hard to complete the demolition of the old central block. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I visit that site and see how that structure was built with the lack of proper reinforcement back in the 1960s, it is a wonder that that building did not fall under its own weight. That was a disaster waiting to happen. Thousands of people could have died if that had collapsed with a full patient load at visiting times with visitors, with a full complement of nurses, doctors, and everybody. Thousands of people could have died. It is a miracle that this country was spared that trauma. And before I close, I want to thank most sincerely our Honorable Prime Minister, who is the only Prime Minister who read that report and who acted on that report and supported his Minister of Health in getting that project done. Others had that report and built Coover. Others had that report when the price of oil was $100 plus. Others had that report when LifeSport was losing $200, $300, $400 million. Others had that report when the Beetham wastewater plant squandered $500 million in this country and did absolutely nothing. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I close, this motion is frivolous. It should have been dealt with at a joint select committee. But as I said, history will not absolve them for not going that route because they want nothing good for Trinidad and Tobago, whether it's health, crime, or anything else. This country must go to hell in a handbasket so they can come back into power. But the most of the people of Trinidad and Tobago are sensible and reasonable. And lastly, may I thank the Minister of Energy and the Prime Minister for the Dragon gas deal. That, I believe, will stand Trinidad and Tobago in good stead in years to come. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I recognize the member for Kumuto Manzalino. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am honored to stand before you in this August chamber to speak on this very important motion brought by my colleague, the Honorable Member for Faisabad, that I support this motion fully. And Dr. Bodo is an excellent obstetrician and gynecologist. But permit me first to talk about my colleague's response, member from, Honorable Member from St. Joseph, the Welsh Report. The Welsh Report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, was a straightforward recommendation. It did not require a joint select committee. A joint select committee, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is timely. It takes a lot of effort and is quite costly. And they have already started to implement some procedures on that. But they have issues on implementation. So I'm asking the Honorable Member for St. Joseph, why is that? Why are they having issues now? But I want to take another point for the member. Minister for St. Joseph, take your criticism don't take it personally. How can we be expected to make rational and objective decisions for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago in the health sector? My colleague, the member for Faisabad, did nothing for OB 
gynae that was said, but I have here in my hand, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a copy of a report of the Maternity Services Review Honourable, Committee. Honorable Member, um, please, no display, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of the Maternity Services Review Committee, Trinidad and Tobago, 2013. 2013, yes. And the chairperson was Dr. Lakram Bodo. He created a position of Director of Women's Health and of Trinidad and Tobago, and the woman of Trinidad and Tobago exists now, is benefiting. The member for St. Joseph said, that this is of no substance. I disagree. I'm sure if you have a consultation or any further meeting, you will hear the cries on the ground of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. He also mentioned something about life expectancy. But you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you speak about life expectancy, that has to be assessed over a period of time. If the government was in had government for seven years. How can you measure that life expectancy? And you see it increase. So that is a fallacy. We need to see that sort of data. Then you boasted about dengue. To the honorable member, dengue all over the Caribbean. It is seasonal and cases have dropped right across the Caribbean, not only in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's nothing to be boastful about. Now, it was also said that we spent a lot of money on dialysis, angiogram, stents, heart surgery, as we should. That's, that's our people for Trinidad and Tobago. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, here is a narrative. How many people have been waiting? How many people died waiting? How many people died waiting for heart surgery? How many people died waiting for dialysis? Imagine a patient died from dialysis and the, the, the social worker is calling. How the patient doing on private dialysis? No, the patient dead. So I'm asking the honorable member again in his um, deliberation, we are talking about linear accelerator. Everything is in port Spain. What about San Fernando? We still waiting for angiogram in San Fernando Hospital. So you had no excuse not to open the Children's Hospital. You used it, you opened it only at the start of the pandemic. So you know you bashed the member for Siparia. It is not her doing. You were in government. You are the one to have opened it and you did not open it. So I shall start. I shall begin. Let me put God in our present in this chamber, as I quote from a psalm from Life Application Bible, chapter 103, verse 2 to 4. Praise the Lord my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns with love and compassion. And what this means to me, O oh, Father, so many have fallen more persons are sick, some are homeless, some are hungry, jobless, crime rampant. The nation is in strife, and our Lord, we have a decaying society. Help us, O Lord, and remove the pestilence from our blessed nation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are here to debate several issues pertaining to the health sector, be it COVID or non-COVID related, because from 2019 to 2023, we have issues across the board. I will show where the Ministry of Health have failed in its response, in its responsibility to deliver optimum health care. I will attempt to do that through the eyes of patients, of our people of Trinidad and Tobago. My approach, Mr. Deputy Speaker, will be as follows, to discuss the primary health care aspect that's the first response when you go to a health center or a doctor. Complaints to the health care institutions. And thirdly, impact of COVID-19 with regards to non-communicable disease. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, even before the pandemic, the health sector was in shambles. Everyone knows that. 
Junior 2010-2015 Partnership Government under the stewardship of the Senior Council Kamala Prasad Bisesa, plans were being made to provide a first-class healthcare system for this country. I want to thank my political leader, Kamala Prasad Bisesa, for her vision, her wisdom, and love for the people of Trinidad and Tobago for putting health systems in place, be it a hospital, primary health care, and staffing, as my colleague from Faisabad spoke about the El Dorado Nursing um, Institute. I continue to endorse her as my political leader, and she will rise again. At the onset, Madam Speaker, I want to say condolences, Mr. Deputy Speaker, sorry. I want to say condolences to the families and friends are those who lost loved ones, be it COVID or non-COVID related disease. Many of these deaths could have been avoided. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will leave that right now for the moment. It is of paramount importance for me to pay tribute to the resilient, hardworking, and dedicated healthcare workers who de deal with all manner of patients on a daily basis. Yes, they need a round of applause, surely. These staff, be doctors, yes, Minister of Health, doctors, yes. I support all my medical colleagues, nurses, wards maids, cleaners, ambulance, technicians. They have been overworked. They are underpaid. The little time off, and many of them go without having a meal. They have the hungry bellies. And they work with limited supplies, medical and non-medical. They are our heroes without capes. Some got COVID and died. Some found difficulty with their personal Ill illnesses, with non-communicable diseases. They got very sick and died. Some struggled with financial issues and some with relationships and family issues. That's what it is to be a healthcare worker. So while we are looking after sick people, you yourself are struggling. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we must speak of the unsung heroes during the vaccination drive of the COVID-19. I await when the Minister of Health will pay tribute to these doctors, nurses, and other staff that helped and gave their time, their money, their talents, and resources. I thank you, I thank you, and I thank you. To the Minister of Health, what is important to understand is these people provide selfless service. Even though all these medical staff are being paid, they have a passion for people. And if I had a hat, I'd put my hat off for these people. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me edify everyone here in the chamber about primary health care. The World Health Organization defines as all people everywhere have the right to achieve the highest attainable level of health. This is a fundamental premise of primary health care. It enables health systems to support personal health needs from health promotion to disease prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, palliative care, and more. Primary health care is the most inclusive cost-effective and effective approach to enhance people's physical, mental health, and as well as social being. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Trinidad, this sounds like a fairy tale because right now, the healthcare system leaves a lot to be desired. I know many people say, what are you talking about? The, Minister of health, the Ministry of Health has adopted the patient charter of rights. Patient has rights. But in many instances, these rights have gone out the window. But when you hear the complaints and the cries of people when they interact with the healthcare system, and this is, you could do it randomly, you'll hear things like they were scolded, they were barked at in a high and rough voice, and asking them, what you come here for? Your case is not an emergency. Really, really, this is pathetic. And we could do better with customer services. This is what we have patient charter of rights. This country has one of the highest incidence of non communicable disease per capita, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the region. So what are NCDs, as we keep hearing that word, and it's made up of simply four classes of diseases. One, cardiovascular disease, be it heart and stroke. Two, 
diabetes. Three, cancer. Four, chronic respiratory disease, asthma, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I can tell you as a medical practitioner for over 25 years, shorter than my colleague from Faisabad, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will deal with these patients on a daily basis. And one thing is common about our people in Trinidad and Tobago, maybe in other countries as well, they do not take their health seriously. Be it a poor diet, and they miss out taking their prescription medication, or they stop it if they have to consume alcohol. In this country, you'd go to the best specialist, the best doctor, but you know what? On the quality of our people, the neighbor tell you, boy, don't take that tablet. You'll get sick, take my tablet. We share medication, we share bush. Maybe some bush might be good, but at the end of the day, we don't take our health seriously. So what that means is that you get sick, your hypertension, your diabetes, your asthma, your cardiac disease, and whatnot. So if there is a burden in the healthcare system. It creates more financial strife for any government. So it starts with us. Many people refuse to exercise. Many people keep abusing alcohol and smoking and other drugs of abuse. They don't want to go to a medical checkup. You know, it's a statement to say, well, I have elderly parents, so I'm expected to live uh, a ripe old age. I sweat a lot, I exercise. So they say, I don't need a checkup. Primary health care, protect yourselves. And this is the mantra for the Ministry of Health, the Health Promotion Unit, the Health Education Unit. You need to get out there and do what needs to be done. And it starts from the school. I can only describe the healthcare system in a couple words. As some of my um, clients would have told me, as they feel it's a dark, gloomy, uncertain, and dreadful when they go to the healthcare system. And I know the Honourable Member for St. Joseph is coming to say, I'm here to paint a bleak pit here. There is good. There is good in everything. However, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the facts are the facts, and let it speak for itself. It is no secret that between 2020 and 2022, that this nation went into a lockdown in order to curb the spread of COVID-19 virus. Now, our citizens had to decide if to go to the health facility or the hospital, or if they were to um, stay home and with their infections. And in most cases, they stayed home because they were scared. The white tent is still there. They were scared to go to the white tent. When they went there, there's a level of paranoia. The neighbor tell them, if you go to the white tent, you won't come out back, you probably died. And many persons, especially those with a non-communicable disease, they get more and more sick to the point is they perished at their homes. So what does that mean? It means that we fell short somewhere. Those are lives that should not have been lost. Those are lives that should be preserved. That means we messed up somewhere in terms of the communication so that these people were left out there on their own because when people got sick during the pandemic and as it continues, when people got sick during the lockdowns, they needed, they expected some level of medical consultation to come to their home. And this is somewhat so overwhelmed by the county medical officer of health office in every region, they were not able to contact them as they should. And these people who could not afford it were left on their own. They sent their family to get medication. And sadly, I know of families who one or two members in that household would have died. So many people have now opted, Mr. Deputy Speaker, not although the COVID-19 has slowed down in number of cases, they have opted not to go to the clinics. What does mean, Mr. Deputy Speaker? They are taking their lives in their hands. Some take medication, some don't. They go to the pharmacies, they buy, or they keep sharing medication. That's a common thing that happens in our country. So when I tell them, I say, listen, you will get very sick, you'll be hospitalized and die. But you know what they say? In the famous scene of Doris Day, que sera, si, sera, what will be, will be. Many people who are sick with non communicable disease during that COVID-19 crisis, what happened is that they did not, they were not able to see a doctor because we knew that the clinics were partially open. I repeat, the clinics were partially open. The doctors wrote prescription. So what did that mean for people? It meant 
that they couldn't tell the doctor what was going on with them in terms of adverse effects to the medication, what side effects that they had, what the disease process was getting worse, and what was their present status, whether the blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol was going higher. Now, what that meant, they didn't have an opportunity for referral, the doctor could hardly see, so that they could have sent them to the eye doctor or that the feet were swelling, they could go to the cardiologist or see a nephrologist. So what happened then, people went blind. People lost the kidneys, they needed dialysis. People needed um, angiograms and whatnot. So we had mentioned um, about the programs that was there in terms of um, angiograms and CT scans and MRI and whatnot. During the height of this pandemic, what has happened, many people fell short on an ability to request these services like blood tests, x-rays and all these scans. And it was very difficult for these people. It was very, very difficult for these people because they didn't ask. So they, their lives daily was whatever happens, happens. And I must tell you that a report that came out from many people who did survive the white tent and they had to wait long hours and days there. There was, and we have to say, it, there were no washroom facilities or for any sort of washing. The families had to bring pull-ups because they had to do business right there. And they had to wait days before if they were positive to go to a COVID hospital or ICU bed. And in that time, they died. I'm sure people are listening to me. They are members of families who understand and identify with that sort of scenario. It has to be said. So why we are here today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, so that we can make it better next time around. We work collaboratively to ensure that the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago can get a first-class healthcare system, no matter who is in government. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the medical trauma against exhausted healthcare workers. It, it, it's really sad that sometimes that what has happened is that they themselves can't help themselves. And that's why I pay tribute over and over to all our healthcare workers. Because at the end of the day, we don't want our healthcare workers making mistakes. And it must be said that our young doctors and nurses do you need height of this global pandemic, look at the Simonga report. They never saw so many deaths. Imagine this is your son or your daughter, your niece, your nephew. They never saw so many deaths. In fact, I have colleagues who said in one shift, eight out of 10 persons die. So I would ask the member for St. Joseph, maybe it is or maybe it's not, that there should be counseling centers, ongoing counseling for all these healthcare professions who are part and parcel of it, because we will have a very sick society as time going. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what I want, I want to bring with is the prescription items. The minister from St. John's alluded to drugs. Now, there is a shortage of drugs. There is no question about it. Now, where does the drugs come from? C40. So, Depends on where you are. If you're in a rural community or you're in a town, an urban area, the urban tend to go faster. But here is the thing. Some of these poor people will have to travel to get a CDA prescription. And if you look at whether it's in a government pharmacy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, or privately they go into the private pharmacies, they may get three out of 10 items. They live in a limited budget. They have to purchase. So instead of sometimes they purchase, so instead of time, they use three times a day, they might use twice or once a day or every other day. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, these are our patients that are getting more and more sick. And everyone in this room will tell you, they know someone who is under 50, who now is diabetic, hypertension, asthmatic, or cardiac disease, or have cancer. And that is the issue. That was one of the features that came out of the Simonga report in terms of NCDs. And the, the thing about it is that the diagnosis of some of these diseases, like um, those patients who have to get dialysis, it takes a while. I know you have to be interviewed by the social worker and whatnot. Same thing with chest pains. There are many people who need urgent cardiac intervention. I know that the minister boasted about from 
Sam St. Joseph about how many they have done. But you know what? Our people deserve the best. Our people deserve it. I'm not comparing any other countries. I'm talking about Trinidad and Tobago. Our people deserve to get the best. I have seen something that was mentioned by the minister from St. Joseph that we forgot our diabetic feet. Yeah, yeah, diabetic feet. So many persons now in diabetes, long-standing diabetes, you have disease in your feet called peripheral vascular disease where you lose your circulation and per peripheral neuropathy where you can't feel. So a tom tack or a nail may go under the foot and before you notice in a couple of days the smell, the discharge and that's it, the feet get septic, septic. And in that time they may get gangrene and lose a limb, lose a life. And that is a common thing now in this world of Trinidad and Tobago, very, very common. I, I tell you, if you don't do something, you'll have a lot of people, especially in the central area, where amputations, according to Professor Naren Singh, is the highest in the central area. So now I will reach another area here, and um, what I'm going to talk about is, right, it's medication. So I just mentioned something about medication. Now, many people, Mr. Deputy Speaker, cannot afford to buy the medication. So in some instances, especially for the elderly, they live in a pension which is shared up and they have all these bills to pay. So it's either they buy the medication or buy food. And now with the RIC doing everything on higher electricity rates, that will be another spin in the pit here. I say to everyone, the surest way to escape depression and defeat and despair is action. When you are down, get up. No matter how hard it is, to get outside your head. Get back into the world when the sun is shining. The UNC will rise again. The sun will shine on the political leader, Kamal Passad Bissester. I will continue with my um, presentation and talk about the significance of the health burden and what it has done. Now, the number one health burden in terms of non-communicable disease is heart disease. The second is diabetes. But what we notice now in this country is that medication. We have a lot of generic medication out there. Some works, but some may not work. We have two things that's happening. We have a lot of suitcase traders in the country. That is mean who people bring pharmaceuticals from other CARICOM countries and bring it at cheaper price. Some of them are good, but here's the problem they are not tested. So people take their life in their hands sometimes when you buy this cheap medication and don't take what is prescribed. And also there is another avenue called counterfeit medication, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that is rampant in Trinidad and Tobago like the rest of the world. So what I want to ask the Minister of Health is um, the status of the chemistry, food, and drug division on Frederick Street. Are we testing medication that, that we consume in this country? Another fallback going now, still in health, but what happened, and I have to say it in terms of mental health, is the online learning during the height of the pandemic. Our children, our, the mental state of our children. I know there is a lot of research being done all over the world, but I tell you, our children, develop, Mr. Deputy Speaker, anxiety, sleep disorders, and some of them became abusive to their siblings and even their parents. They felt like they were trapped in a prison. And especially in my area there, in rural areas in Kumoto, Manzanana, where there was a lack of connectivity, they dropped out of school and they went into other things besides school. Gang warfare, they went into work, at a very young age. And also, the health aspects of that, the sedentary lifestyle and more eating led to obesity, which is a risk factor for non-communicable disease. And I must mention as well, we saw an, an increase in domestic violence, an increase in alcohol abuse. Sabrina Mola Baksh, the general manager of Coalition Against Domestic Violence added, she said, no matter what argument... Mr. Deputy Speaker, most respectfully, stand in order 48-1. OK. 
Okay. Um, remember, I, I know you now started, so I'll give you a little leeway. Let me hear where you're going, and we will determine accordingly. All right. Proceed. Uh -huh. Right. What I want to talk about now, seeing that what my colleague has said, is about persons in the healthcare system that belong to the clinics. Now, what I mentioned before is that many persons have decided, opted not to return to the clinics. Many people, member of President Joseph, think that the clinics are a waste of time. That, that's their concept. And I think this is where the Ministry of Health now have to come with ingenious ideas to pull people back into the clinic system. If we don't pull people back to the clinic system, you're going to have a, a heavier economic burden at the hospital end because they will take the little pension or whatever money they have and go to the private doctors, but it is not enough. Blood tests and other diagnostic tests are expensive. So I am just... One second, member. I'm scouring the resolution. No, I remember, I'll have to get a standing order, please. There isn't a resolution on this. Okay. Thanks, Mama. Proceed, member. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as the government initiated um, a COVID-19 committee to look into the state of the health sector due to COVID, the Simonga report was very damning against the government in terms of lack of medication and supplies such as PPE and gloves. Two, lack of especially nursing staff and high rates of NCDs, that's why we are here. What I want to ask the Honorable Member, Honorable President Member, Joseph. Um, kindly, before you proceed, um, you have just about two minutes of your initial speaking time. You care for your additional 15? Yeah, it must take about two, three minutes after that. Thank you, Bruce, Mr. Proceed. Deputy Chair. Yeah. Yes, I want to ask the member for St. Joseph about the National Strategic Plan for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Disease for Trinidad and Tobago. There is that strat plan that was on the Ministry of Health website 2017 to 2021, which said working together to build a, better, a healthy and happy nation. But it's like it's off the website, so we have to look at that again. So I'm asking the, the member, what are we doing? Are we talking about non-communicable disease according to the Simonga report. Where is that? As I continue, and among the persons who were hospitalized or who would have died, what is said in the Simonga report that more attention needs to be paid at a young age for people with non-communicable disease. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's gone down now to the 20s, not the 60s and 50s anymore. You have young people being diagnosed with all sorts of non-communicable disease, and it's real. It is very real because of poor lifestyles. So I'm asking that the Ministry of Health increase the education at schools. I know that the school feeding program, what they would have done is um, provide healthy meals to the children together with NAMDEVCO, and that's the way to go. But more and more education needs to be done. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are in the carnival season, and we have seen many young persons have adopted unhealthy lifestyle, abuse of alcohol, smoking, and I'm seeing a trend now that you have very cheap cigarettes outside. They outside. And you know they are unfiltered, so you could imagine what's going to happen to these people long when they hit um, their 20s. Hon Honorable Member, again, yes. you, I think you, you're just moving a, a little bit from the, what we, the motion we are dealing with, so I'll ask you to, you know, not to get into that aspect, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sort of wrapping up now, and um, what I want to say before I go is to talk about mental health. Mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities. And now there is a focus for mental health, so I won't drag it on, but our population of Trinidad and Tobago, mental health is a key, critical issue on what we need to deal with. And uh, the Ministry of Health needs to do the following. Reduce risk, build resilience, establish supportive environments, for mental health, because depression and anxiety is quite common upon our populations. Our citizens of Trinidad and Tobago 
needs to be looked at. And the words of Nelson Mandela, a fundamental concern for others is our individual and community lives will go a long way in making the world a better place we so passionately dream of. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with these few words, I graciously thank you. God bless. I know, I know recognize the member for San Fernando West. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise to contribute to this motion. I would perhaps characterize the contribution coming from the member for Faisabad as anemic. I say that with the greatest of respect, but the honorable member crafted a motion which is based upon six recitals and comes to two recommendations. I characterize the contribution by the member for Faisabad as anemic for the following reasons. The first recital asks us to take note that whereas it is the duty of the government to provide a safe and reliable healthcare service during a pandemic. The second recital is an allegation that the government has failed to address the existing inequities in accessing healthcare and procedures exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic. The third supposition is that the government has allegedly failed to provide well-equipped and well-stocked secured spaces for healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. The fourth allegation is that the government has failed to meet international standards for patient care highlighted in the report of the committee appointed to investigate factors contributing to the COVID-19 patients in Trinidad. The fifth allegation is that the government has failed to effectively manage resources and facilitate movement of critically ill patients to and from nation's hospitals, again, in the context of pandemic. The sixth allegation is that the government has allegedly mismanaged medical specialists, denying best clinical care for COVID-19 patients. The resolutions are that the House take note of unacceptable number of deaths from COVID-19. And the second resolution is that the House call on the government to take immediate steps to initiate a commission of inquiry. The Honorable Member for Faisabad spoke at large in dilute form, not targeting the resolution to the very measures that the Honorable Member put forward, which is in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Worse yet, the Honorable Member failed to recognize any form of contribution as to why we ought to have... Mr. Deputy Speaker, I respectfully rise on standing order 48-1. The member clearly is citing the wrong motion. He got the motion mixed up. San Fernando East and West okay. seems to be similarly misplacing okay, which motion. Thanks, if they thank, thanks, member. Thanks, member. Um, just for clarity, it's motion number one we are dealing with, member. Well, I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm referring, unfortunately, to the order coming from um, my, my chair, but I will redress immediately to the context this way. In the responsibility of the Ministry of Health, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and in focusing upon the Simungal report, the Honorable Member, in speaking, to the outcome of clinical outcomes of COVID-19 patients at recital number three, makes an allegation that the report of the committee appointed to investigate the factors contributing to clinical outcomes of COVID-19 patients highlights the existence of multiple chronic and non-communicable diseases. Again, in the context of the motion, 
the honorable member has asked us in recitals one and two to treat with it in the form of the resolution and it's an allegation effectively that the house resolved to take note of the failure allegedly of the government to deliver on its health sector mandate so mr deputy speaker when we look to the health sector mandate the honorable minister of health in his reply in addressing and tacking back the allegations put us into the context of the following mr deputy speaker number one in answer to the member for Faisabad, the member for Faisabad started off by laying a proposition that we're dealing with the fundamental right to health care. The honorable member then went on to pose that it was fair to critique the health care system and that it was even so far fair that leaders join in that battle of critique. The honorable member posited that the critical analysis was required, a critical analysis was required on the healthcare system. And then, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member said that the country was fortunate for the parallel healthcare system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the position volunteered by the member for Faisabad was that we were supposedly the government guilty of fooling people and that the healthcare system was operating and he focused on the COVID-19 attention zone. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me put my response in the context of my submission that the member's contribution was anemic and dilute in his spread of, 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 the, uh, of the positions that he adopted in supporting the resolution. Let me say why I make that submission because Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we target by way of litmus test, by way of example, the greatest stress that the healthcare system suffered during the last nearly 100 years certainly was the stress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you look at the data coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, you will note 4,319 odd citizens out of a total of nearly 1.35 citizens succumb to COVID. And if you look at the supposition that it is the responsibility of the Ministry of Health to protect, promote, and improve the health status of citizens, let's look at that tested under the COVID-19 dynamic. Look at it at the lens of COVID-19. I dare say that the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health have risen to the challenge because when the system was put under the greatest level of stress in that COVID-19 lens, we saw the minister take advantage of operationalizing numbers one, two, three, and four of operation success. Number one, there was dedication to plant and machinery in the healthcare system via the Minister of Health. Number two, there was dedication to process. Number three, there was dedication to the people inside the healthcare system. Number four, there was dedication to the laws under which the minister operates and the Ministry of Health operates the healthcare system. So let's look at that in the context of the motion. The Minister of Health can safely say, by way of achievements, demonstrated in delivering an analysis of plant and machinery, people, care and process, that the COVID-19 results demonstrate that we were able to operate a parallel healthcare system utilizing Trinidad and Tobago's best and brightest, utilizing Trinidad and Tobago's most caring or nursing personnel, etc., our technocrats in the system, and what did we produce? We produced in early, early 2020, towards mid-2020, a position ranking of number one in the world in terms of COVID management. We produced a ranking which then resulted in us managing our healthcare sector, creating a parallel system, coming with a system that the Minister of Health could track which says how many bed days we have, 
the Ministry of Health in managing the system to protect and promote and improve healthcare status was able to say, roll out a vaccination program, procure the vaccination drugs, administer them in tandem with the private sector and NGO sector, bring about focused attention on making sure that we had beds in the system to look after people. And we went, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from the days when we were counting how many bed days were left in Trinidad and Tobago in November of 2021, we have now come to March 2023, February 2023, January 2023, that is the three months, the one included ahead of us, to a system where Trinidad and Tobago is now speaking about the mother of all carnivals, where the Minister of Health is now able to say that the rolling infections for COVID are being monitored and that not one swallow does a summer make because the opposition convened a press conference to say that there was a COVID surge and the Minister of Health dealt with that very commendably. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in terms of answering the allegations that the Minister of Health is not managing the healthcare system, I'd like to put on record as it relates to the plant and machinery that the minister is managing, that it is no small achievement for the Ministry of Health to have the tail of the tape spoken today. And that tail of the tape, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is tied to the PSIP. If you look at the public sector investment program of the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health is able to say today that the city for the Sangre Grande Hospital has been operationalized, and over 30 to 40,000 patients have been assessed, accessing service. The minister is able to say in terms of addition of plant and machinery that the Arima Hospital is opened. The minister of health is able to say the Point Fourteen Hospital is opened. The minister is able to say that the linear accelerator for targeted cancer care treatment is opened. The minister is able to say that the Dago Martin Health Center is open. The minister is able to say that the upgrade for the CT lab at the San Fernando General Hospital is in work. The minister is able to say that the emergency department of the San Fernando General Hospital and the Point Fourteen General Hospital are now completely paperless. And when you look at that plant and machinery improvement, I focused on what this government has built from scratch, financed from scratch, and I'm going to add now that the Minister of Health is able to say that the construction of the Sangre Grande General Hospital is at 63% as at yesterday's date. The Minister is able to say that the Port of Spain Central Block project is at 30%. The minister is able to say that the head office billing for the Ministry of Health is at 77% as at today's date in terms of completion. What does that represent? That represents a direct answer to the anemia of the motion. That demonstrates a multi-billion dollar investment in plant and machinery in Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad here, and Tobago, of course, feeding in terms of emergency services that have to be referred here. What does the Honorable Minister demonstrate because of that? Yes, billions of dollars spent without bacchanal, allegation of corruption, allegation of mismanagement, none of that. And the Minister of Health is now able to say that added to that come the people to every single healthcare professional in this country, be they doctors, specialists or otherwise, be they nursing personnel, ward attendants, janitorial services, we are talking now of thousands of jobs available to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, represents a Minister of Health and a government led by our Honourable Prime Minister that are 
targeting public sector investment works and programs into the healthcare sector to ensure that we have delivery in answer to the first recital. Responsible management to protect, promote, and improve the health status of citizens. This Minister of Health was the first Minister of Health to go against the battle of the bulge. Obesity in the age range 25 to over 60 represents in Trinidad and Tobago, there are nearly over 53% of our population that are obese, they're overweight. Coming with obesity are the risks because of our genetic characteristics, be it our Indo or Afro um, origins, where our non-communicable diseases for Indo-Trinidadians, there is the risk of diabetes as far as I'm informed, and for Afro-Trinidadians, there is the risk of hypertension. Two closely associated NCDs that come as underlying criterion which reveal themselves in events of pandemic. So the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw from the daily charts given to us by Drs. Hines and Richards and the CMO, we saw that the people who were actually in the category of morbidity, people who died from COVID, were people that were suffering from underlying things. Everybody now knows the term. It's called comorbidities. And those comorbidities are non-communicable diseases, obesity, leading to diabetes, hypertension. It is the Honorable Minister of Health that led the charge against sugar in schools. It is the Honorable Minister of Health that ensured that there was a significant reduction in soft drinks at schools, targeting the education campaign, targeting the delivery to ensure that sugar was removed from diet. It is the Minister of Health the Minister of Agriculture, then Clarence Rambarat as well, the Honorable Prime Minister that said, use the school feeding program in a more measured way to address recital number one here so that we would deal with obesity, deal with diabetes, deal with hypertension. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you look at the complaints of citizens regarding drug shortages and long waiting times for healthcare services, it is the Minister of Health, Terence Dialsing, member for St. Joseph, who introduced what the Venn list is. You know what the Venn list is? The Venn list is the list of drugs that comprises the most essential drugs that we have to buy. It is then bought under the C40 system by NIPDEC. And it was the Minister of Health, Terence Dialsing, the Honorable Minister Terence Dialsing, member for St. Joseph, who came and pointed out that as a result of a reduction in the Venn list, a better targeting in the Venn list, that the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago was able to save, if I recall the number, over $240 million per annum in how we procure drugs. It is this Minister of Health that was able to come to the fore and say, that we were not managing the expiry of drugs. It is this Minister of Health that ensured that we did not throw away, as was happening under the People Partnership, as I recall, nearly $100 million a year in expired drugs. And therefore, the efficiency and management brought by the Minister of Health, who has been the same Minister of Health for the last seven, going on eight years, has been definitely an answer to the recitals of this motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we look at the allegations brought forward that we are not managing chronic non-communicable diseases in our population, I dare say that we need to be reminded that it is the Honorable Minister of Health who targeted not only NCDs but targeted it from birth and if you look to the maternal death rate and infant mortality rate, it is this Minister of Health and this government that has resulted in us having the best 
statistical outlay some of the best in the world as it relates to the improvements in the number of mummies that die and the number of babies that die in the course of childbirth. And that did not happen by mistake. It happened by a dedicated program of plant and machinery, of people, and of processes. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to touch on the point raised by my colleague, the member for St. Joseph, in relation to the Welch Report. You see, there's been passing reference to the Welch Report from the opposition. The member for Faisabad attempted to say, well, yeah, I know the Welch Report came, but that is not something that we should look at because the honorable member said in relation to that report that it really was a matter that could be dealt with other than through a joint select committee. The member for Komuto Manzanilla, the honorable member, said that a JSC is costly and that it was not appropriate for the Welch report. Permit me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to say some of what the Welch report demonstrates. And I want to put it in the context of the motion. The motion is telling us that there have been complaints from citizens that there's a responsibility to manage healthcare to protect and promote the health status. The, the motion is telling us that the government's approach to healthcare has failed. That's the allegation. And inside of the Welch Report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, forms the crux of the working model that the Minister of Health and the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago have been managing it's the approach towards healthcare. So I spoke about plant and machinery. I demonstrated the capital PSIP works, the number of hospitals, health centers, the thousands of jobs that will come with that by this expenditure of the billions of dollars across the entire Trinidad and Tobago. And let me add quite correctly the Coover Hospital to that pack. The other members opposite us would like to say that the Coover Hospital was built under the then government. Yes, the procurement of that construction happened under them, but it was a working site and the hospital was not in a position for opening. And more particularly, the addition of jobs can be tacked on to that as well. So there are thousands of jobs. So let me get to the Welch report now and why the Honorable Member's member for, the member for Faisabad's contribution is anemic, in my humble estimation. When we look to the Welch Report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what did the Welch Report treat with? The Welch Report treated with a number of areas that are relevant to this motion. And let's see what they deal with. So, the allegation is that the government has not managed and is somehow just floating blindly and not looking after people. My submission and answer is that the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrates that to be a complete falsehood because of the manner in which we were rated, ranked, and performed, and where we stand now. Secondly, my answer to that submission is that this government, in terms of management, not only commissioned the Welch Report, but by cabinet interaction led by the Prime Minister himself, the Honorable Prime Minister, made sure that there were, not only the report was produced, but that there were consultations, public consultations held on the Welch Report. It is a matter of record that the Ministry of Public Administration and Communications engaged in national public consultations to get feedback from members of the public on the Welch Report. That further to that, the Ministry of Health then had consultations with the regional health authorities to strategize the way for the implementation of the recommendations. And that that included a review of healthcare delivery at the regional health authorities broken down into 251 sub-activities. The Welch Report, which is the management tool by which the government has done a lot of what it has performed, 
came up with recommendations which can easily be grouped into seven pillars. And what are they? Primary healthcare analysis, secondary and tertiary healthcare institutions, infrastructure, vertical services, the RHA executives and the administration, the chief medical officer and the entire pool that comprises the people that stand and professionals that stand there, and then the Ministry of Health Administration. And what I can say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that each one of these recommendations form strategic focus for the healthcare system. You see, if I were to examine the roadmap strategy of the UNC government when they held the reins of power in 2010 to 2015, there was no collation document of policies. And the Welch Report represents seven pillar focus of policies. What are they? The seven pillar focuses I've just identified, I wanna focus on some of the sub pillars and then I'll come to why it is relevant and why this motion is misguided and why my submission of anemia stands. If we look to the pillars and we focus now on the primary healthcare pillar, it is this Minister of Health that can speak to the upgrade of the Accident and Emergency Department at San Fernando General Hospital with focus on triage, layout, staffing, equipment, process flow. As I said earlier, it is this Minister of Health that can speak to the a &E department being completely paperless as at today. What does that mean? If you're paperless, the medical records at triage stage, at primary intervention stage, at secondary intervention stage, at the a &E is going electronically. So when a patient is transferred out of a &E, elsewhere, the medical record is instantaneous. So the very examples that Faisabad gave us of mistreatment as a result of records going wrong, etc., that is now obviated because of the electronic database that San Fernando General can speak about. Where was that as a grounding philosophy in the UNC? Connect that now to the whole of government approach. What is the whole of government approach? It is the Prime Minister, the Honorable Keith Rowley himself, who instructed the government to go to Estonia to form an MOU. It is our Honorable Prime Minister that established a Minister of Digital Transformation to take the helm. It is that ministry, in conjunction with the Ministry of Health, that today can say, our a and &E in San Fernando and Point Fortin are paperless. It is that ministry that will be able to marry births and deaths live at the hospital in terms of births and tragically associated with deaths wherever they occur at hospitals and they're brought in. Bedside registration, whole of government communication, so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the one hand, we have the UNC old talk and reference to scatter here and scatter there. And today now, you understand from the Minister of Health, there's an integration between the healthcare system at the Ministry of Health and at the RHAs and at private facilities as there's transfer to and from. And today we can say that in terms of the primary healthcare pillar, that we are well over 70% in implementation of that Welch report. Team building, health centers, block appointments, process for supervision and monitoring of staff, ongoing strengthening and monitoring of processes to facilitate transfer of patients. Let me stick up in there. It is this Minister of Health who did the opposite of the battle between Fuad Khan and Anan Ram Logan in the procuring of ambulance services in Trinidad and Tobago, where there was a standoff between the then Attorney General Ram Logan and then Minister of Health for the procurement of ambulance services. Our Minister of Health has done the exact opposite with proper, transparent procurement of services for movement of patients. You have two more minutes. You care to avail yourself of your additional? Yes, please, Mr. Deputy Proceed. Speaker. Thank you. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is our Minister of Health that can speak under that primary pillar of clinical reporting guidelines across all primary healthcare institutions being upgraded. The review and assessment of extended hours at health centers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, under the secondary and tertiary um, pillars, that's the second head of the Welsh report, 17 sub-activities. This minister can speak to tracking them at over 70% performance as at today's date. Coordination of transportation and rotation of staff, use of equipment, looking at stress units, looking at service delivery, specialist registers, clinical guidelines and protocols for chronic diseases. It is this minister that can speak to medical device pillar with 49 sub-activities. It is this minister that has delivered the linear accelerator for cancer treatment to tie into the whole of government approach. This minister can speak to the refurbishment of the maternity ward at San Fernando General Hospital, high-risk medical equipment at institutions. This minister can speak to over 90% performance in the vertical services pillar with nine sub-activities, drug advisory committee, the reconstitution of it, the backlog of, drudges, of drugs, terms of reference for strengthening of the blood transfusion service. Let me stick a pin. It is this Minister of Health, together with Dr. Charles, who has pioneered the approach to making sure we move away from the CHIT system in the blood bank system with the consequent risks of HIV contamination and poor blood management to voluntary positions. Something which was spoken about for decades. Ask anybody in the emergency of needing blood whether they have it or not and then go and talk to the member for St. Joseph about himself pioneering the blood transfusion system and blood donor system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, under the Regional Health Authority Executive and Administrative Pillar, it is this minister, this minister that can speak to 35 pillars, sub-activity pillars, with over 90% performance on implementation of key activities, strengthening of discharge instructions at RHAs, looking at quality risk committees being established, customer relations officers, systemic and institutional auditing, etc., under the CMO pillar, with the two sub-activities in the re-establishment of the principal medical officers and looking at the RHA integration of monitoring and problems, we saw that come under direct analysis. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Dr. Roshan Parisram as the CMO, Dr. Mariam Richards, Dr. Avery Hines and team, Dr. Trotman, etc., those distinguished professionals, Dr. Parisram receiving the ORTT, the highest national award, they were recognized internationally for the level of performance. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I say this with a great sincerity. All that we heard from the opposition was personalized attacks against these officers. I have never seen members with privilege under Section 55 of the Constitution in the Parliament, so merrily attack public servants who can't defend themselves as the opposition did. Shame, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that we would reach to that level. But, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is no different from what was done on things that make Trinidad and Tobago better, like the dragon da gas deal, and I'll just leave that there. Just bad talk everything. So in public health officers, bad talk them, personalize them, pong them, say all sorts of things about people that can't even defend themselves as public servants. I've never seen public servants attack like that in my professional life, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, under the Ministry of Health administration pillar with 89 sub-activities, we're over 70%. And let me focus on point number one, the electronic health records. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've already linked the work of the Ministry of Digital Trans Transformation. Let me link it to that which I operated in delivering at the Legal Affairs Division and the Attorney General's Office and the Judiciary, where all things went electronic. Let me just say the whole of government approach to healthcare records. That priority is under this Minister of Health, 
What comes with better records? Accuracy. Immediacy of, of, of records. You arrive at point 14, but your record is in Scarborough. It's delivered. What do we have under the UNC? Well, we could have used the helicopter that the member for Sipari was using to transport records, but that didn't happen. That just was personal conveyance from Philippines to Port of Spain. $25,000 a trip each time. Electronic transmission of records and electronic data banking by the Minister of Health will change the lives of citizens and will reduce the cost of patient care. You see, whether the opposition likes it or not, what the government had to deal with in the management of our healthcare system is directly related to the cost of that system against the revenue. And that's why when the Minister of Health spoke and reflected upon the GDP performance and the improvement in our economy that the Ministry of Finance has been able to deliver for the benefit of our country, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is no gain saying that the Minister of Health worked a miracle alongside the Honorable Prime Minister guiding us all when the price of oil was at minus $2. West Texas Intermediate during the COVID pandemic. You know what that means? You had to pay somebody $2 US to move a barrel of oil. You're giving it away for free and then you're paying $2 extra. When the Minister of Finance came to the country in 2016 and said, listen, we have lost 96% of our revenue. If the annual revenue from oil and gas was $21 billion a year, as it was under the member for Siparia, it fell to $400 million. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know what that means? We had no money to manage, but yet the Welch Report was able to be produced with a roadmap for success Yet, the Welsh report was able to be delivered to this House. And what did we recommend, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the members pour scorn on and try to just pass over today? The Honourable Prime Minister directed not only the production of the Welsh report, the seven pillars, the many sub-pillars, but that it come after public consultation, after consultation to the RHAs, that it come to the floor of the Parliament and be referred to a committee of the Parliament. Standing Order 111 of the House of Representatives, General Powers of Select Committees. In addition to powers granted by Standing Orders, Select Committees, of which that committee would have been one, shall also have the following powers, namely to A. Send for persons, papers, and records. B. Sit notwithstanding any adjournment of the House. C. Adjourn from place to place. D. Report from time to time. E. Appoint specialist advisors either to supply information which is not otherwise readily available or to elucidate matters of complexity with the committee's order of reference. F. Communicate with any other committee on matters of common interest. And G, meet concurrently with any other committee for purposes deliberating, taking evidence, or considering draft reports. Now, how on the good Lord's earth could that be an expensive exercise as per my colleague from Komuto Manzanilla? How could the member for, for Faisabad, with a serious face, in trying to justify the member for Siparia's direction not to allow that report to come forward. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know how it was killed? You can't appoint a joint select committee if it ain't joint. If the opposition boycotts the committee, there's no committee. So you mean to tell me that the government stepped forward with a seven-pillar Welch Report Committee, many subset committees, put it into the parliament, not with the multi-million dollar expense of a commission of inquiry, but with the fluidity of a commonwealth operation for select committee with power to subpoena people, bring people, analyze, send it to the public accounts committee chaired by an opposition member, send it to the public accounts state and um, enterprises committee, DPA subcommittee, send it to national securities, call for papers. You mean to tell me that the opposition submission is that that's costly and a waste of time? Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know what we're seeing? 
This is, this is what we call smart manism. This is what we call playing smart with foolishness. So there you have on the left hand, the Honorable Prime Minister saying, here's our report. Here's the result of public consultation. These are the pillars. Take it in the parliament. Track it against every item of expenditure, every head of expenditure, budget to budget. Track it against PSIP. Track it against IDF. Knock yourself out with transparency. Call whoever you want. Monitor the performance. And today we hear from Faisabad and Kamuto Manzanella, well, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't best for, for a special select committee. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is just reprehensible illogic. The vacuity of that thought process is alarming, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I dare say that the Honorable Minister of Health is someone that is not often commended publicly for the work that the Honorable Minister did. I want to remind that the CMO and team are managed by the Minister of Health. I want to remind that the guidance that we got in the COVID pandemic came from coordination of the cabinet led by the Honorable Prime Minister. I'd like to say that the Minister of Health in ensuring that he is at every health center, every hospital, every site, I would like to express my profound gratitude and admiration of my colleague, the member for St. Joseph, as the Minister of Health, who I believe has distinguished himself above every single Minister of Health in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. There was a time when the Ministry of Health was raw bacchanal and chaos, not under my friend and colleague, the Honorable Minister Terence Dial Singh, the member for St. Joseph, the Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is serious business. The opposition asked the country to accept chaos and bacchanal and challenge as the diet with which we should sustain ourselves. The same way, when I held the post as Attorney General, I had to oversee $14 million on litigation against the COVID-19 pandemic in the healthcare system. A challenge brought by the opposition against the public health regulations to declare them unconstitutional in the case of Dominic Suraj. Thank the Lord God for the Privy Council where not only were the public health regulations held to be the right method that we adopted and managed this country through tragedy, but every single law that I volunteered and this cabinet approved and that the Prime Minister approved for debate under the hand of the Attorney General and that was passed on a simple majority basis, every last one of them were upheld because the Privy Council reaffirmed the proportionality principle in the case of Surat. That did not happen by mistake, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I dare say I staked my entire legal reputation on the sustenance, on the sustenance of Surat. With those words... You have approximately three more minutes. With those words coming to a conclusion shortly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to remind there were days when the opposition joked, made fun of the reliance on Surat. Our insistence to move away from the minority decision in Barry Francis. But I'd like to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, could you imagine the public health system, the COVID-19 attack by the opposition, attacking the laws that we use to save this country and the citizens of this country, attacking the constitutionality of the public health regulations, if that attack had prospered, not only would the regulations have fell, but every single simple majority law that we passed would also have fallen. So I say today, we are pleased in this government to be able to stand our ground. Whether we stand up for the United Nations Charter and the sovereignty of nations, whether we stand up for our ability to be friends to our neighbors, both to the east of us or to the north of us, whether we stand up for the public health care system and underwriting it by laws that are proportionate for the peace, order, and good governance of our society. I would like to say I have faith in this government. 
and the record of this government speaks for itself. It is not a one-man show. It is a combination of the efforts of many of us working together, we being officers for the time being entrusted with whatever portfolio we have, because we are all conscious that there is change always guaranteed as we age and as we experience our democracy at work. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I reject this motion as being folly. I say that the member has at best been scattered and anemic in his approach, the Honorable Member for Faisabad. I want to salute my colleague, the hard-working member for St. Joseph, the Honorable Terence Dialsing, in my mind, the best Minister of Health this country has ever seen. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Coover South. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As I join this very timely and relevant motion, which has been articulated in a very clinical manner, argued in a very decisive manner by my colleague, the Member of Parliament for Faisabad, and ably supported by my other colleague, the Member of Parliament for Kumito Manzanella. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the last speaker, the Member for San Fernando West and the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, in his opening lines as it relates to his contribution, stated that the contribution of my colleague, the member for Komoto Manzanilla, was anemic. But based on the fact that the honorable member was debating the wrong motion here this afternoon initially, all I can conclude, all I can conclude, and I see that he's exiting the chamber, that his response has been one of uh, comatose, being in ICU and not being able to put forward any credible response to my two colleagues who have spoken on this particular debate in the, uh, on this motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister of Health in response to the member for Faisabad, attempted to sing the praises of the public health care system in Trinidad and Tobago. And we all want, as citizens of the country, to be proud of our public health care system. But having, after having spent over $30 billion in the last seven into the eight year of being the government of Trinidad and Tobago, this is what was reported in a UK travel advisory. And I quote, in some areas of Trinidad and Tobago, medical facilities can be limited. Private clinics, are able to treat most ordinary problems, but medical evacuation to Miami or elsewhere may be necessary in more serious cases. Mr. Deputy Speaker, make sure you have adequate travel insurance and accessible funds to cover the cost of any medical treatment and repatriation. In addition to that, Canada told its citizens in a travel advisory, do not expect medical services to be the same as in Canada. 
dated the 26th of January, 2023, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That in itself tells you where we are. And if that was not enough, if that was not enough, and they have had eight years, they are into their eighth year to get it right, I want to read a headline from an express article, the 22nd of January, 2023. Today is what? The 27th of January, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the headlines read, Facing long wait times, overcrowding at state hospitals, private health care gaining public's confidence, written by Camille Hunt. And the article was based on an interview conducted by the author and the medical director of the St. Augustine Private Healthcare Facility or private hospital, Dr. Ajit Udit, and the hospital general uh, manager, Jerome McCarthy, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I quote, the major reason for people choosing private healthcare was not the quality, but rather the timeliness in accessing. A patient may have a choice of doing a surgery now in the private system or wait, I want to reiterate, or wait two years in the public healthcare system. And the article went on and on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, there was also one dated the 14th, you see, I quoted one from January of 2023. I now want to quote from one dated uh, the Friday, the 14th of January, 2022. So 2023, 2022, and this, the headline was um, one, healthcare system has collapsed. And this was written by one Daniel T. Bertie, who sent it via email to the Newsday of the 14th of January, 2022. So whether it's in 2023, whether we are in 2022, nothing has improved as it relates to the state of the healthcare system in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And even, even the outgoing head of state of Trinidad and Tobago has said that there is the need for visionary. Um, member, I prefer we don't go down that avenue, please. So. Next point. Guided, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but persons in high office throughout the length and breadth of this country, they are very concerned about the state of the healthcare system in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are some very critical issues that have been put into this motion wrongfully by members of the government, and it is my responsibility to set the record straight here this afternoon, not only on behalf of the opposition benches, but for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, all and sundry on the government's side during their relevant contributions, have attempted to paint or create this narrative that the opposition had the responsibility. If you, if you listen to them very carefully, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you will feel that the opposition led by the member for Siparia had the responsibility to implement the recommendations of the Welsh report, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, it is important because the Minister of Health said that history will not absolve the member for Siparia for not allowing the Welsh report to go to a joint select committee. But I want to put it to the member, the member for St. Joseph that he is indeed the biggest hypocrite as it relates, relates to being a Minister of Health in Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, the very fact that they and members of the government 
indicated that we did not support the need for this report to go to a joint select committee, I want to ask the government whether the compilation of the report, this Welsh report, was a matter of a draft bill? Was it a legislative matter that needed the cabinet, the prime minister, the government to get the, govern the opposition support? This was not a draft piece of legislation that was being debated by the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This was uh, a policy decision from the angle of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is the responsibility of the government, clearly not the member for Superior, clearly not the opposition, to implement decisions of a report if they wanted to have the political will on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Every one of the recommendations of the Welsh report in the interest of the people would have been implemented by this government over the last seven years, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And if they had any strength, if they had the political will, if they had the fortitude on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I challenge any one of them to stand up and say what they have done as it relates to the report. Not one of them could come and tell you during this particular debate, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where is the data or the data on waiting times and waiting the waiting list for surgical and non-surgical operation at the regional health authorities? Have they gathered this? And what have they done with this in terms of um, reducing the, the, the plight of, of the ordinary people who continue to tell you that they get clinical appointments uh, two and three years whether it is at the uh, North Central, the Southwest, you name it, throughout the length and breadth of all the RHAs. Also, who, what are the, in terms of the statistics, what is the time frame, for example, for the admin, advertisement of the vacant chief executive officer position at the North West Regional Health Authority, and what have they done Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the number of citizens who access healthcare on an annual basis at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, and the date and key findings of the last audit conducted at the Regional Health Authority, as well as the remedial steps taken based on the findings. Where is the leadership from the Minister of Health? He comes here to parrot about the UNC not giving support to a particular uh, report, not knowing, knowing fully well, knowing fully well that they are being deceitful and they are being misleading to the population of Trinidad and Tobago in terms of the implementation of the recommendation of the Welsh report. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Speaker. that language is wholly unparliamentary. 48.6, on parliamentary language, speaker, and I want to know on whose behalf he is okay. speaking. Thank you, member. Overrule, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. You see the member for Lavin. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in addition to the, the, the real issues, um, as it relates to the Welsh report, the Minister of Health should have come and told us what or where is the data on the waiting times and the waiting list for surgical and non-surgical operations at the RHAs throughout Trinidad and Tobago. And 
Do not engage in cheap politics here this evening as it relates to the status of the Welsh report, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The opposition rejects the narrative that has been created here this evening and will tell the government of Trinidad and Tobago that the politicking is enough, implement the recommendation and get on with the job because time is longer than twine, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in relation to what the government is attempting to do here this evening. What they are trying to do is to keep the status quo of the health sector as is uh, and frustrate the potential progress in dealing with the issues, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the members of the government, again, in their cheap politics, Cheap politics and propaganda went on and attired about members of the opposition attacking public servants and so on, and persons who were appointed by the government as it relates to uh, their respective roles in the pandemic and so on. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the opposition is not about personalities you know. the opposition is about uh, make, making our voices heard on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and Mr. Deputy Speaker when vaccines could not be procured in a, ta in a timely manner when there was mass vaccination chaos when uh, persons could not find out as it relates to the whereabouts of their loved ones within the public health system of Trinidad and Tobago, when persons whose relatives died within the public health system during the COVID-19 pandemic, and they could not know about their whereabouts. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when over 4,000 200 persons died during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is our responsibility in the opposition to question the, comp the competence of those who were charged with the responsibility. The competence, not about personalities. This had nothing to do about personalities. This was uh, seeking answers on behalf of over 4,200 persons, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from the point of view of their families. And where, I want to ask the Minister of Health, when the North Central Regional Health Authority kicked out senior doctors based on this so-called rotation of, of doctors during the COVID-19 pandemic at the Coover Hospital, where was the voice of the Minister of Health to protect the senior doctors? Where was he? Did, he pro did the Minister of Health offer any protection to the senior doctors who were kicked out in the most unceremonious of manners based on this um, politically, vindicted, um, politically um, vindictive policy they conceptualized through the North, South, North Central Regional Health Authority, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That board was appointed by the Cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago, who gave the instructions, who gave the instructions to the, the then the, the acting chief executive officer, one Mr. Davlin Thomas. Did the minister leave the politics at the door? These are the questions that have to be answered, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and don't come with cheap political propaganda in this house. The United National Congress will defend, will defend those and set the record straight, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So we want to put it on the record that history will indeed absolve the member for Siparia and the United National Congress for asking the questions on behalf 
of the voiceless people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, in addition to this issue of condemning or not condemning the attacks on public servants, Mr. Deputy Speaker, during his contribution to this particular debate here this afternoon, the Minister of Health attempted to boast about how many patients were dialyzed in the public health system and the successes of the current renal system and so on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the 4th of November, 2022, my colleague, the member for Faisabad, in questioning the Minister of Health, posed the following question to him. Will the Minister provide the status of the following renal dialysis unit at the Kuva Hospital, the cardiac categorization lab at the San Fernando General Hospital, and see the, re the renal dialysis centers to be built at Mount Hope and San Fernando. The minister indicated that as of the 12th of April 2018, the assets of the Kuva multi training, medical and multi training facility were vested in a special purpose company, being the Kuva Medical and Multi Training Facility, of which you is a majority shall hold and so on. And in this regard, he was not prepared to make a response. And the matter of the renal dialysis center to be built at Mount Hope and San Fernando are before the courts and are therefore sub -judice. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this again is the propaganda that they engage in, members of the government. Because you come and you attempt to boast about how many persons have been dialyzed, but you do not tell the country how many persons are not able to access dialysis and cannot afford dialysis and are awaiting government support. And in building these centers, it would help those of our citizens who are seeking assistance as it relates to renal dialysis. And we, would not, we, we are not told whether the matters from a legal point of view have been settled and the centers that were promised by the government of Trinidad and Tobago by the sitting Minister of Health where it is in terms of its construction. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am sure that if you take a walk through the dialysis or the renal ward at Mount Hope, or you do, do so at San Fernando. It is in chaos. None of the beds are working. They are in shambles. My sources tell me they more or less have collapsed, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the most critical issue, too, currently that has to be answered, or which, which should be answered, and I challenge any one of them who are coming to speak after me, put the record straight from the point of view of the government, are the wards properly resourced or service or staff from the point of view of doctors and also the specialized nurses or the specialist nurses that are needed within the respective wards from a renal point of view within the healthcare system? Is, the, is there an adequate ratio? 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, don't attempt to spread half-truths. Don't attempt to spread propaganda in your quest to make the population feel, indeed, you are doing something on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is a sad state of affairs as it relates to the state of the renal wards throughout the public health care system in Trinidad and Tobago. And that leads me to another very critical issue or argument which was put forward by the Comatose member for San Fernando West, the former Attorney General. Um, Honorable Member, Honorable Member, I would like you to retract what you just said. Please, we're not getting into the personality of it. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm guided. The Honorable. No, you have to retract it. You have to retract I, I, it. I retract. I retract, Mr. Thank Deputy you. Speaker. You know, you always have my cooperation during this deliberation. And. And, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member boasted about the fact that the government has been able to operationalize Point 14 and Arima and, uh, in a way, Coover. He boasted that the government will be able to create thousands, he boasted thousands of jobs for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But they will never tell you that they did not have the vision to construct San, the Coover Children's Hospital. They never had the vision for Arima. Neither they had the vision for Point 14. It was uh, the member for Siparia and uh, a forward-thinking people's partnership government which understood uh, the health needs of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we were on a march between 2010 and 2015. So when they boast about Arima and they boast about Point 14, they must tell you, say, Thank you to the member for Siparia and thank you People's Partnership Government. But more importantly, again, their propaganda, again, their deceit, again, again, why you cannot trust them, I want to read into the record. Because the Minister of Health could not have stood during his contribution or anyone who have spoken in this debate on behalf of the government to tell us in a very clinical manner how many jobs have been created in the public health system over the last eight years. Mr. Deputy Speaker, but more importantly, and I will come to it because we have the data, we have the statistics, because we are thinking on behalf of the people of this country, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, I do not know how many, because we know for a fact that there are approximately seven or 800 young doctors who are in search of employment. Nurses are migrating out of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And in a question that was posed by my colleague to the Minister of Health, Will the minister... Honourable member, before you proceed, you have just about two more minutes of your initial speaking time. You have an additional 15. Care to avail yourself? Yes, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wish you could have given me an extension here this afternoon of... Uh, 15 a, minutes, proceed. ...a greater magnitude. 15. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, my colleague, the member for Faisabad, asked... The Minister of Health, will the Minister 
provide the number of established proposed positions inclusive of the number of filled positions for each category of staff on the establishment at the following institution, the Arima uh, Hospital and the Point Fourteen Hospital, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, you, it is amazing to note that on uh, an establishment of, out of 1,134 pers um, vacancies, or established positions, sorry, at Arima, only 757 have been filled. And also at the Point Fourteen Hospital, there are 482 established positions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, approximately only 300 have been filled by uh, the Ministry of Health, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, that brings me to the very important issue of nurses, within the public health care system of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the government, again, in the last couple of years, attempted to create a narrative that they are concerned about the welfare of the medical personnel, or as they termed it, the frontline personnel in the fight against COVID-19. And also, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the whole question of the filling of vacancies on behalf of nurses in Trinidad and Tobago. Again, that was something that the government attempted to create and make us feel that this indeed was something that the government was dealing with from a, a, a very aggressive manner, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the budget of 2022, the Minister of Finance committed the government of Trinidad and Tobago to addressing the very critical issue of the regularization or the security of tenure of nurses who were on contract position throughout the country. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in fact, on the 19th of January 2022, as the Member of Parliament for Kuva South, I posed the following question to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform this House of the status of the commitment given by the Minister of Finance for the fiscal year 2022, in which he indicated that the security of tenure of nurses employed on contract in the various regional health authorities would be investigated and finalized by the end of December 2021. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, in, we are in January of 2023. Where is the report? Where is the leadership from the Minister of Health, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as it relates to addressing the very critical issue of the regularization of the security of tenure of uh, nurses in the public health care system? And where is their pension plan? Where is their pension plan? And as a result of the inability of the government to deal with these matters in a decisive manner, nurses are exiting Trinidad and Tobago by the thousands. That is the legacy of the member for St. Joseph. That is the legacy of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. And that is the legacy of the most incompetent government as it relates to the healthcare sector in Trinidad and Tobago that we have seen between 2015 and 2023 and counting, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Incompetence at its best. 
chaos at its best, and you could count on that from the Minister of Health, the member for St. Joseph. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that and uh, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister did indicate that uh, this will be investigated and dealt with in a very decisive manner. And you know what, Mr. Deputy Speaker? They, if, you, if you listen to them, you would believe that they, every issue affecting medical workers and frontline healthcare workers during this pandemic was addressed. They gave an allowance and they taxed it. They took it back, so they gave you a gift and then they took back half of the gift and they wanted they want Trinidad and Tobago, they want the workers, they want the, the, the healthcare workers to feel, the nurses, that their issue is being addressed as it relates to regularization and their pension plan. But I want to ask the Minister of Health if he knows about a matter in the civil courts, in the Court of Appeal, in the matter of the Industrial Relations Act, Chapter 8801 between the North Cent Central Regional Health Authority, the Trinidad and Tobago Nurses Association, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, uh, and the Trinidad um, and Tobago Registered Honourable Nurses Member, Association. Honorable Member, I've given you certain leeway. But when I peruse the particular motion, all right, I give you some leeway with regards to the discussion on pensions, with regards to the discussion on nurses. But if you peruse the four main points in the motion, all right, I will, from now on in, I'll need to guide you as to whether we will proceed or whether we will not proceed. Okay, honorable member? Right? So the nurses and the pension and the, and the, the, the trade unions and stuff, you know, let's tread carefully, please. Thank you. I am, uh, I am guided. I am guided, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is merely our continued role to act as the voices of those who do not have the vo their voices within this parliamentary chamber. And it is the, on, in that context we are putting, I am not putting falsehood out in the domain here this afternoon, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We are putting issues to the government of Trinidad okay. and Tobago. Hon Honorable member, I understand you clearly, but I am referring to the particular motion that we are dealing with. I, I, I do not want to stop you from, from your, 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 your discourse, but I have to guide you accordingly based on the motion that is before us members. Right? And I think that goes for all members. Fair enough, member? Proceed. Very fair, Mr. Deputy Speaker. How much time do I have again? You finish at 5.16. Thank you. So just, about, just about nine minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, as it relates to the whole question of the very motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago are very concerned because the rate of inflation has indeed impacted upon the ability to pay for healthcare services in Trinidad and Tobago and also the ability to purchase drugs which are prescribed by doctors within the public health care system of the country. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is, has been established by, clearly by my colleagues on, on this side during their respective contribution, that when persons present prescriptions at the public health care pharmacies in the country, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the only drugs probably that they are able to get, they are able to access, is probably a Panadol or aspirin 
or folic acid and so on. But individuals are unable to get at the institutions such drugs such as Brillantan, Vimada, and, and uh, Coreg, and I could go on and on based on my interactions with constituents because they make their trek. The Coover District Health Facility, I do not know if you are very familiar with the geography of the Coover South Constituency Compound and the Coover Health Facility is less than, uh, uh, less than 100 meters, if I should uh, put it in that context. And they make that trek to my office on an ongoing basis, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and they bemoan to me about their inability to access quality drugs within the public health care pharmacies of the country. And what was our approach to drugs and supplies, Mr. Deputy Speaker? And when I say our approach, the government led by um, the member for Superior was to allocate funding for drugs and supplies. The government's approach well, is one of cutting, cutting funding for drugs and supplies from a high of $617 million in 2015. It has reached $241 million in 2023. And why, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that is a cause for concern and that is why, why ordinary citizens cannot get quality drugs within the healthcare system of Trinidad and Tobago. And they could come and attempt to boast about the revamping of the CDAP system in this country. We will not have, we will have none of it because we reject their arguments. Their arguments will not hold any water because the 19 of us, we are bombarded with complaints from our constituents. And I'm sure, I am sure they too have that complaint from the point of view of constituents who go to their respective offices as, of, as members of parliament and bemoan the fact that they cannot get quality drugs at the pharmacies within the public health care system of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one may be forced to ask the very important and relevant question. A government is supposed to protect the entire population from becoming ill and ensure that the population is protected from all forms of diseases and outbreak. It is the foremost responsibility of a government to promote and save lives, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is within the constitutional framework of our country that it is expected such to be done by a government when it is elected into office. And the buck stops at the end of the day with the Minister of Health and uh, his team, or whether it is adv his advisors and uh, his heads of divisions and so on, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is the government's responsibility. And one has to, ha has to ask the question whether there has been effective communication with the population in terms of hospitals, health centers, educational institutions using the print and electronic media and all forms of social uh, media platforms. Indeed, whether the government is playing its role in promoting and saving lives and whether the government is, has been able to tackle the spread of non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, lung diseases, cancers, and immune disorders in terms of their impact upon the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, where we are today, 
We are not in a, a good position, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We are certainly not in a good position as it relates to the state of our healthcare system. The Minister of Health has been the minister into his eighth year. This is another failed sector of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Citizens have indeed experienced the worst healthcare system since our political independence, since 1962. The government's pervasive criminal negligence has not in only resulted in the Deputy deaths. Speaker, Standard Order 486, criminal negligence. Members, please. Members, um, members, please. Member? Right. So again, member, I will have to ask you to rephrase, withdraw that, withdraw the comment, and you know, you're free to say something. I, I, I withdraw, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the government's negligence and incompetence has resulted in the deaths of thousands of citizens of this country, not only from the COVID-19 pandemic, but its lack of care for patients with chronic, non-communicable diseases of di diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. In their last eight budgets, almost they have promised you almost everything under the sun, scientific networking through a network of modern facilities, but again, the much-promised central block of Port of Spain is not constructed after eight years in, in Dr. Rowley being the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is uh, this side, it is the side led by the member for Siparia, which gave uh, the Coover Hospital which gave the San Fernando Teaching Hospital, which gave the commencement of the Arima and Point Fortin Hospital, and who gave the people of Trinidad and Tobago hope in a modern healthcare system. I thank you. I will now recognize the member for Tobago East. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to contribute to the debate on this motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the public health care system perfect? No, it's not. Do we have gaps, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Yes, we do. Do we have certain inefficiencies we need to address? Yes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But the same could be said for almost any country within the region or any country around the world. Mr. Deputy Speaker, having said that, I want to place on the record that Trinidad and Tobago can boast of having one of the best, if not the best, public health care system in our region. Mr. Deputy Speaker, just permit me to just share with you a little story. I remember in my first term as a member of parliament, I fell ill during a debate and I had to seek medical attention. I remember my personal assistant came to pick me up. She asked where um, I wanted to go, and I said to her, my tax dollars paying for public health, so I go into a public institution. And we went to St. James Health Facility. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the quality of care that I received was beyond what I would have experienced while living elsewhere. The staff were compassionate, they were professional, but most importantly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they embraced the tenets of the profession and they demonstrated it not only to me, but to every single patient who was at the facility at the time. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, even though I wasn't in perfect health, I took the opportunity to examine what was happening around me within the health facility. And I can place on the record that we have some of the best public health care professionals in the world. And I want to commend them, Mr. Deputy Speaker. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, another story. Just recently, my father fell ill, and again, I was at work here in the parliament, and I remember rushing across to Tobago. And by the time I got up to my parents' house in Roxborough, my dad was already home. Thank God for the fact that we had a visionary PNM government that collaborated with the then Tobago House of Assembly to establish in Roxborough a Roxborough hospital. My father didn't have to journey to Scarborough to access health care. He was able to go to the facility in Roxborough and receive attention. And by the time I got home, he was comfortably resting in his bed. Mr. Deputy Speaker, my story isn't unique, and I want to share some testimonies before I get into the meat of the discussion from persons within Trinidad and Tobago who have high praises for the healthcare system. And I want to start off, if you permit me, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to quote a Candice from Tranquility Beauty Spa, who shared her story recently on Facebook on a post on January 25th, 2023. And th these are Candice's words. Hey guys, this is Candice from Tranquility Beauty Spa. This weekend, since Sunday, was quite a weekend. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and today, which is Wednesday, I have been to the San Fernando General Hospital with my daughter. I thank God everything is okay with her now. I'm doing this video to say thank you. Thank you to all the staff of the San Fernando General Hospital from when I came in. We are talking about the wards made, the security, the nurses, the doctors, the kitchen staff, and the cleaners. Talk about service. It was wonderful. They took really good care of my daughter, and they took really good care of me. We are in the teaching hospital. They were cleaning the area at least five times every day. The place was clean. Everything was top notch. I normally hear horror stories about persons and the service they receive at the hospital, but that wasn't my story, and I am showing appreciation. I am showing gratitude. I am extremely pleased. You know with all the care that was given to my toddler, and I thank God that she pulled through because she was critical. Thank you all at the San Fernando General Hospital for helping us and for being such a good support system and giving such good quality health care. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Candice wasn't talking about some fancy private institution. She was talking about our, an institution, our public health care system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, another testimonial, and permit me to share. This one from the page 13 of the Newsday, December 15, 2022. Kudos to Arima Hospital staffers. The editor, when my doctor told me to go to the hospital after medical examination of my chest and lungs, I thought to myself, go to a hospital in Trinidad? She might as well have told me to jump off the Twin Towers. I made my peace with God just in case and went to the Arima District Hospital. As I entered the compound, I can tell you in advance that the external beauty of this structure is no match for the beauty of the workers inside. The wheelchair operator came to collect me from my car and I told her, this is my first time here. She assured me, you will get the best treatment here. Boy, was she right. The staff worked on me immediately and tried to regularize my situation. There was order, compassion, gentleness, thorough questioning by Dr. Malu, who then informed me of his plan of action for my recovery. Various tests were done, and the results noted on my file the very same night. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this was from a root Samaru, and I could bring forward more testimonials, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but these stories aren't uncommon. You see what happens in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is oftentimes the bad news the philapses, those make the front page, those are the ones I would spread, but the good news, the good work being done is often hit on a bushel. And I want to take the opportunity, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to commend my colleague, the member for St. Joseph, the Honorable Mr. Terrell Dial Singh, 
for his work, for his effort in improving the healthcare system in Trinidad and Tobago, but most importantly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for improving the situation for women and children as it pertains to accessing quality healthcare in the public health system in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Con Honourable colleague, thank you on behalf of the citizenry. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I start, stated at the beginning, it isn't perfect, but work is being done. We haven't gotten everything correct, but we are working diligently towards producing for the people of this country a world-class, top-of-the-notch public healthcare system. And that is demonstrated, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by the fact that every single year, and I'm, this is in response to my colleague from Coover South who just spoke, every single year, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a billion TT dollars is expending on pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical items. When Ms. The, member, the member for Kufa South spoke recently, he noted that we weren't allocating enough resources towards um, pharmaceuticals and persons were struggling to receive the necessary drugs, etc., in the public health care system. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, every single year, a billion dollars is used to ensure that our citizens can access pharmaceuticals within the public health care system. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to go on to demonstrate to you how the work that has been done by the Honorable Minister of Health over the last seven going on eight years would have improved circumstances for women and children as it pertains to accessing quality health care. And I'm going to list some of the interventions, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Ministry of Health would have coordinated customer service improvements. So they have timed clinic visits, customer service training, extended visiting hours, and allowing partners to accompany and participate in the birthing process. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I remember a few years ago, at least about 10 years back, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a friend of mine um, wanting to have a partner be there with her to give birth, and that wasn't allowed. Thankfully, we now see where measures have been put in place to have partners accompany their wives, their girls, friends in the room to be there to give them that emotional support. And I want to commend the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health to recognizing that that process of birthing requires the entire family unit in terms of the husband or the boyfriend as well as the wife to be there to give that support. It's important to start that bonding process from as early as possible. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they created new operating theaters and labor wards, expanded emergency department service, obstetric theaters and day assessment units, and operationalized a coloscopy center. The Ministry of Health would have ensured that they have upgraded all neonatal units with more available beds. Babies are now ventilated for the first time in Tobago and Sangue Grande, reducing the need for transfers and improved staffing and leadership at these units. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they procured advanced transport for neonatal incubators and ultrasound machines, giving our babies who are born early or born in distress the best possible chance to survive. This is what our Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health in collaboration with the various regional authorities, this is what they are doing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to give our little children the best possible start in life. They implemented a perinatal information system an electronic medical record system in the public health facilities to allow for real-time generation of maternal and neonatal statistics. They introduced standardized data collection tools on births and maternal and neonatal mortality, elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis, neonatal unit admissions, and breastfeeding to improve decision-making. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are some countries around the world where mother-to-child transmission of HIV is still a reality. We are fortunate to say here in Trinidad and Tobago that we have eliminated mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis. So kudos to the Ministry of Health and the Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
They developed clinical guidelines and protocols on a wide range of pregnancy-related complications to standardize care. They introduced new hormonal contraceptive implants to expand contraceptive choices. And I want to share another story, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the issue of choice for women, especially when it comes to their sexual and reproductive health and rights is very important. I remember after giving birth to my son and going for, you know, the post visits at the health center and getting into an argument with a doctor because he wanted to dictate to me how I should choose my method of contraception. But we see here now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, where the Ministry of Health has seen it has introduced new hormonal contraceptive implants to expand contraceptive choice, giving women greater choice of over how they treat with their reproductive ability and their reproductive rights. So kudos to the Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, they facilitated training of healthcare workers in a wide range of topics in obstetrics and ne neonatology. The Ministry of Health developed health education materials, both for patient information brochures as well as newspaper articles on a wide range of women's health issues. And I want to commend the Minister of Health again and the Ministry as well as all the regional health authorities for the information they have been putting out into the public domain. I don't think there's anything that I go on Facebook and I don't see something popping up from the Ministry of Health. And there's been a lot of discussion this evening about um, dialysis and access to dialysis, dialysis as well as you know, non-communicable diseases. But I think the approach by the Ministry of Health and the Minister of Health to create public education and sensitization material so the citizens can understand that their health is their wealth and take ownership over their health and ensuring that their health and well, their well-being is their priority and to encourage citizens as well as children to embrace healthy lifestyle will help us in the long term in terms of reducing the burden of the state in terms of health care. If your body is healthy, if you're well, then you reduce the need for you to visit a health center or hospital. So I want to encourage the citizenry at this time to let us really look at how we are our lifestyle choices. Let us embrace, as the Minister of Health would always advocate for, healthy eating, exercise. I will see the Minister of Health walking along the corridors very often, stretching his legs, and he's practicing what he's preaching. I would see him visiting institutions and talking to children and encouraging them to eat more fruits instead of accepting the fizzy drinks as well as the sweets and schools. And that is what we should all be doing, joining the conversation, encouraging our constituents to embrace a healthier lifestyle. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Ministry of Health can be commended for the establishment of the National Sexual Reproductive Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Healthcare Committee. The Ministry of Health can be commended for strengthening of adverse events, near miss analysis, and reporting to improve clinical practices and outcome. The Ministry of Health introduced regular countrywide meetings with stakeholders, including regular team drills for emergency management, research, and training. There's the there's the enhancement of maternal and child health services for early detection, care, and treatment of HIV and syphilis in pregnant women, their partners, and infants. Mr. Deputy Speaker, coordination of the COVID-19 response for obstetrics and gynecology services including, included the introduction of the COVID-19 vaccine for pregnant women, implementation of a data collection system to collect data on COVID-19 positive mothers and their babies, provision of updated guidance to the public and private health sectors, advocacy for the initiation and or continuation of breastfeeding by COVID-19 positive mothers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, when many of our women were able to still access hospital care, in times of pregnancy, there were countries around the world, developed countries, what we call first world countries, countries referenced by some of those opposite today, where mothers couldn't access hospital to give birth 
And we have to recognize that despite our challenges, despite the gaps, despite, despite whatever inefficiencies may exist, that we were able to ensure that all women who were going to produce the next generation of Trimbigonians were able to access health care. And I want to again big up my colleague, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we see the establishment of the National Breastfeeding Unit. We see where they introduce staff lactation rooms at all public hospitals. We see the establishment of national coordinated training, including pre-service training for the 20-hour breastfeeding counseling program for nursing and midwifery students. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we can note the development of the Breastfeeding and Beyond, a guide to infant and child feeding book. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we can also note ongoing preparation for health facilities for baby-friendly hospital initiative accreditation by the Pan-American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I would have mentioned before, it is not a perfect system. There are inefficiencies, there are gaps, but we can boast of having one of the best, if not the best, public health care system in the region. And I will go on to demonstrate, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We saw coordinated customer service improvements via timed clinic visits, customer service training, and extended visiting hours, which I would have mentioned previously. But what that did, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is it would have encouraged us in Trinidad and Tobago to work towards achieving all development goals. So prior to 2017, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there was no perinatal information system, and we had no data on births in the public and private health systems. There was no focal point at the Ministry of Health for maternal and child health, and there was a leading, and the leading cause of maternal death was postpartum hemorrhaging. Mr. Deputy Speaker, since 2018, Trinidad and Tobago has achieved the SDGs for maternal and neonatal mortality. In 2022, the maternal mortality was 15.2 per 100,000 life births, the lowest in years, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I mean, any maternal, any mother dying in childbirth is one too many. But the fact that we were able to reduce the numbers is commendable, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There were two deaths, one from COVID-19 and one in the private sector. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we compare to other countries, for example, the United States of America, where the maternal mortality rate in 2020 was 23.8, and the United Kingdom, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the maternity mortality rate in 2018 to 2020 was 10.9. Pardon me? Mr. Deputy Speaker, we introduced new medicine to the health system for postpartum bleeding and incomplete miscarriage. Ex essential life-saving medicines that were not available before for example, intrauterine balloons and misoprostol trans examic acid. Those were introduced, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Additionally, now through the establishment of the Directorate of Women's Health, we have built close working relationship with the regional health authorities and the healthcare providers to revolutionize maternal and child health and allow for the implementation of targeted interventions guided by data. Mr. Deputy Speaker, now every year, an additional 80 to 100 babies and eight to 10 mothers now survive because of the intervention, because, now because of the development, now because of the innovation, now because of the work that is being done by the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health, and those in the public health sector. Mr. Deputy Speaker, prior to our interventions, Tobago did not have a functional neonatal unit, and mothers and babies had to be airlifted at significant cost at significant cost, and also in under less than ideal circumstances. We established the first functional neonatal unit 
and these regular transfers are quickly becoming a thing of the past. And on behalf of all the people of Tobago, on behalf of my constituents, on behalf of the women in Tobago, I say thank you, Mr. Um, Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we improved on the outreach and follow-up of patients postpartum through a hospital-based intervention which addresses postpartum depression and, and all complications of pregnancy, including a significant reduction of wound infections. We were the first to create landmark policies, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The National Sexual and Reproductive Health Policy, the National Breastfeeding Policy, and we are the first country in the region of the Americas to have a policy on intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is highly commendable. So while we acknowledge the fact that yes, we have work to do, let us celebrate the gains, the wins, let us recognize what has been done to improve the public health sector, and let us inform the public so that they too can recognize the investment being made into their safety, their health, their well-being, and celebrate it and champion it. Too many times we put the bad news out and we make it as though it's, a, 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 it's something to, 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 to shout and dance about. And the good news is we don't spread it enough. Let us spread the good news, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Enough work is being done to bring us to a world-class public health sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have taken a preemptive approach to the management of diabetes by trying to prevent diabetes before it occurs through early diagnosis and management of pregnant women through a landmark project with the IDB. In essence, we are treating the baby in the womb to prevent them from developing diabetes in their lifetime. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I remember growing up and getting into high school and for the first time encountering um, children with diabetes. And I remember a close friend of mine who um, had diabetes at school and the fear when one day in the classroom she just wasn't responding. And if we could now in Trinidad and Tobago have early intervention from in the womb to prevent children from developing diabetes in the future, I, that is something commendable. And I just want to say th again, thank you to the Ministry of Health, the Public Health Workers, Minister of Health. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are working diligently to improve our exclusive breastfeeding rate in Trinidad and Tobago, which will also reduce the incidences of non-communicable diseases, including several cancers in future generations. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know the mantra is breast, breast fed is best fed. And I am happy that I would have been able to breastfeed all of my children. I want to encourage women in Trinidad and Tobago, if you have the ability to embrace breastfeeding, it's good for the baby, it's good for you, and it has long-term benefits. Mr. Deputy Speaker, unlike most other countries, including a number of developed countries, where women, as I would have mentioned before, where women could not find beds to deliver, we successfully maintain all our maternal and newborn services at the primary and secondary care level throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. So that again, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is how we are working to ensure that our public health system continues to advance and progress and deliver well for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in terms of um, services available, I want to make mention of some of the outcomes that we have seen since the interventions by the Ministry of Health and the work that has been done over the last few years. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago has continued to achieve its sustainable development goals as it pertains to healthcare. Because of the reduction of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality, the costs of providing care for mothers and babies with severe morbidity in Trinidad and Tobago have been reduced, resulting in economic benefits for the country. Trinidad and Tobago has been recognized nationally, regionally, and internationally for its leadership in maternal and neonatal care. Since 2019, 
Trinidad and Tobago was selected by the Pan American Health Organization to serve on an expert panel for maternal near miss for Latin America and the Caribbean. Trinidad and Tobago was successfully nominated by the Pan American Health Organization to serve on the policy and the coordination committee, special program of research, development, and research training in human reproduction of the World Health Organization for a three-year term, 2019 to 2021. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I could go on and on and on, but I don't think there's any need for me to do that. Honorable Member, you have two more minutes of your initial speaking time. And you also have an additional 15. Thank you, Mr. Deputy you Speaker. You will avail yourself accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I could go on and on and on, but I just want to just make a call to my colleagues on the opposition bench. Yes, we know that we have to do the politics thing, but sometimes we have to put aside the politics and focus on the people. And this is important, especially where health care is concerned. If we stand up and we continue to bad mouth or public health system, if we continue to put out the wrong information, if we continue to misguide the population of Trinidad and Tobago, then we or people would not understand what it is that we have and embrace what we have and collectively work towards a common goal of improving public health in Trinidad and Tobago. I strongly believe in the potential of our people. I strongly believe in the potential of this parliament to bring about meaningful change. But we had to put aside the pettiness, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We had to be bigger than that. We have to be serious, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about the people's business. Healthcare is everybody's business. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the time of pan the pandemic, COVID didn't ask what party you belong to or what color is a jersey. Almost every single household was impacted. Almost every single household was impacted, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And what was able to carry us through was for the first time you saw on the ground the average Trimigo and the average man and woman coming together and working collectively and collaboratively to ensure the safety and well-being of all. So I just want to urge my colleagues, yes, it's not the best. Yes, we have issues. Yes, there's work to be done. But join us, work with us, collaborate with us, partner with us, so that we, be all of us in this honorable house who have been selected by persons in the public domain who are trusting us to work on their behalf, so that we can truly improve the public health care system. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Coover North. Mr. Deputy Speaker and Mr. Deputy Speaker, with reference to Standing Order 4410, I seek your, your leave, your permission to make reference to my notes. Thank you most kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I start off by thanking you for allowing me to join this debate on this timely and important motion brought by my colleague for Faisabad, which asks the House to take note of the failure of the government to deliver on its health sector mandate. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I begin, I would like to thank the Honorable Leader of the Opposition for her wisdom and guidance through which my colleague for Faisabad has piloted this motion today in the House and also for her service to this country as the best and most compassionate Prime Minister this country has ever seen. I say this in the context that the member for Siparia, when as Prime Minister, would have led a government that was people-focused, and in doing so, the Honorable Kamla Pasad Bisesa-led administration 
would have put health Mr. Care Speaker, 48 the four one. The members already being allowed to read. Where are we going? No, no, no. Please, members, please. I overruled. And in doing so, the Honorable Member for Separia would have put health care at the fore and at the key of the development of Trinidad and Tobago. It is no secret, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the People's Partnership was able to accomplish all of this in just five years, and it goes way beyond anything that this government has even hoped to accomplish in the health sector. As a matter of fact, Mr. Deputy Speaker, projects that were deemed necessary and tantamount to the advancement of healthcare for Trinidad and Tobago, which my colleague from Faisabad would have elaborated and explained in his presentation, several of these initiatives were scrapped when they came into office. Such projects would have brought us to world-class status, but it seems as though those on the other side does not want that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to spend a minute or two to respond to what the members before me would have spoken of. And I want to start, I want to start with the member for St. Joseph, who in his contribution, he made reference to the Welch Report, which was an absolute waste of time waste of resources, and waste of taxpayers' money. The Welch Committee did a very inaccurate report, and the UNC wanted no part of a report which was lacking in depth and in substance. The government did not need the opposition to pass any laws, any recommendation, any cabinet decisions, or any implementing programs, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And for the Prime Minister to say that the Welch report was thrown into the dustbin because of the opposition or the opposition leader, I want to tell the members that that is rubbish. But then again, the dustbin is the right place for rubbish. When we look at the contribution made by the member for San Fernando West, who clearly did not know which motion, whether he was going or coming, which motion he was debating, whether one, two, or three, the member for San Fernando West came here to tell this house that uh, we were number one in the world with respect to our COVID management system. But I want him to tell that to the families who would have lost their loved ones. I want him to tell that to the over 4,000 families in this country, Mr. Deputy Speaker, who would have lost loved ones to the mismanagement of this administration with respect to the COVID pandemic. He came, the member for San Fernando West, that is, and made reference to the mother of all carnivals. But it is so sad, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that just yesterday I would have read circulating that the international soccer monarch is not happening. Well, we wait and see. Mr. Speaker, 48 1, please. Where, where are we going? All right, so again, member, I would have given some leeway. Let's stick to the motion, right? You can reference, make reference or whatever, but tie it in with regards to the particular debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Chair, for your guidance. And moving on to the contribution made by the member for Tobago East. The member came to this house and boasted of $1 billion spent for medication, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in responding to my colleague, the member for Coover South. But persons have been coming to our offices, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and complaining that they cannot get medication in the public health system. So I ask, is this another zip line issue? Where has the money gone? Where that $1 billion that was spent for medication, where has that gone? Because persons have been coming to our office and complaining that they cannot even get Panadol. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member made reference to the need for creating public education's campaign, made reference to healthy lifestyle campaign, and so forth, made reference to the diets and so forth. 
I will address these issues later on as I continue my contribution, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I get into the substance of my contribution, I want to focus my contribution on the third citation of the motion, which states, and whereas the report of the committee appointed to investigate the factors contributing to clinical outcomes of COVID-19 patients in Trinidad and Tobago also highlighted the existence of multiple chronic non-communicable diseases in our population. I would like to address an important section of the report highlighting the existence of multiple chronic non-communicable diseases, NCDs, in our population, Mr. Deputy Mr. Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and 55 won B, every speaker across here spoke about NCDs ad infinitum. No, please. Okay, so again, member, right? Um, we are at that time of the day where we can go into tedious repetition, right? So again, I will give you a little leeway, but again, you know, if you're bringing in a new point with regards to that particular thing, um, I think so. I'll give you a little leeway and I will rule accordingly as, we, we, as you go along. Thank you. Thank you most kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I focus my contribution on the third citation, which would have intentionally been left out by my other colleagues who have spoken earlier, leaving room for me to address the third citation. And I make reference to page 42 of the report. It speaks to the health status of a population prior to the pandemic as a factor which has contributed to COVID-19 clinical outcomes. I cite the following from the report, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The link between age and chronic diseases, which lower the immunological response and therefore protection of the individuals from severe diseases and death cannot be disputed. The more populations are unhealthy, the more severe the outcomes due to COVID-19. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in the absence of empirical evidence gathered by this government, one would be hard pressed to draw any conclusion that those who citizens who have lost their lives to the pandemic was a factor of pure, of pure immunological response caused by a poor diet or healthy eating habits. However, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what we do know is that because of the government's systematic dismantling of the agriculture and fisheries sector, citizens find themselves in a position where the propensity to follow on healthy eating habits has greatly increased, hence increasing the risk factor of our population to NCDs. Year after year, we have come to this parliament to hear Minister of Finance read a budget outlining government's lofty plans for agriculture. And in some cases, the purported injection of additional expenditure to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars all of this budgetary spending, of course, is supposed to get towards increasing not just agricultural production as a percentage of GDP or agricultural export as a mean of income, but to achieve Speaker, a very important nutritional security. Standing order 48.1, I understand the link, but this is not the substantive motion, not about agriculture. Members. Okay. All right, and I remember Buzz, you know, it's it's amazing, you know, at this time of the day, you know, everybody have been energized, who are out of the chamber all evening, and now you all come at this late hour. Right, at this late hour. Right, so, 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 so as the speaker, member, proceed. Thank you most kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the point I was attempting to make before I was rudely interrupted is that, uh, proceed. thank you most kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that uh, agriculture production 
also has a very important role to play in the nutritional security of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. But what we are being told by this report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it paints a different picture. Because you see, under this, uh, under this administration, after seven years of budgeting a whooping seven and a half billion dollars behind agriculture, it is very disturbing, even to the average man on the street, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that food and Mr. nutrition... Mr. Deputy Speaker, 46 one. Okay. 48 one. All right. So again, so remember, you're making the point on agriculture, but you have to tie it in quickly, because the longer you proceed on it, you know, I will, I will have to give a ruling. So you, so you need to tie it in with regards to the motion before us on health, on COVID, as specifically identified in the four points. Of course, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I would say that the failure of the government to improve food nutrition is, is a matter that Mr. is Deputy connected Speaker, to the Mr. health Deputy mandate Speaker, of this administration. One. So again, remember tighten quickly. Right? I'd like you to tighten quickly to the Thank motion. you most kindly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, in speaking of the importance of nutritional security, which reduces the risk factor of developing NCDs, which the report itself speak on, and which this motion, Citation 3, touches on, I, I would like a moment to make my contribution towards how Mr. important Deputy it Speaker, is. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have the pleasure <laughs> and relief that I can beg to move that this House do now adjourn to Friday the 3rd of February at 1.30 p.m., where at that sitting it is the government's intention to debate the Firearms Amendment Bill. Thank you very much. Honourable members, could the speaker have his time now? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I can, I can, I can wait on you all. I, I can wait on you all. Honourable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Friday, 3rd February, 2023, at 1:30 p.m. All in favour, say aye. aye. Any against? I think the eyes have it. This house now stands adjourned. Members, I'm on my legs. Honorable members, this house now stands adjourned to Friday, 3rd February 2023 at 1.30 p.m. <laughs>